Well said. Uh, you, you, usually, um, we have people know the, the speaker or are familiar with it. We have so many yes tonight, so it's particularly important, I think. Uh, as you can see from the screen, uh, Charles is a Canon Explorer of Light photographer. And Canon Explorer Light is a small, prestigious group of world leading professional photographers providing insight, inspiration, and education to future generations of creative photographers. Since he's founded Shoot the Light, uh, which is an instructional photographic workshop and series in the mid 90s, <laughs> Charles has cemented his places in the world as one of the top wildlife photographers working today. Charles' world's work has been celebrated internationally with over 40, you know, 40 prestigious awards. His images appear in many publications worldwide, including National Geographic, Outdoor Photographer, Popular Photography, and National Parks, and there's many more. And with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to you, Charles. Um, thanks, Serge. Appreciate it. Um, and thanks, uh, Deborah, for the invite. I greatly appreciate all this. It's been a, a tough time kind of putting it together, but I'm glad, I'm glad we did it. Um, so invite everybody. Um, uh, appreciate it again. Thank you to the Westchester Photographic Society for uh, for having me people on tonight. and the people who are joining us. And thanks to the Canon Explorers of Light for uh, for sponsoring it. You know, if uh, everybody didn't come see these programs and enjoy what we're doing, I uh, wouldn't be doing it myself. So, so we're having a wonderful time. The program today, um, I entitled Comprehensive Wildlife Photography. And what it's really about is the world according to GARP, right? It's, it's kind of my methodology and the way that I do things. Um, again, not meant to be the definitive. It's just here's how I do it, and it's, it's worked for me and uh, probably thousands of people that I've kind of, kind of taught this stuff to over the years. But it goes through everything. It goes through composition and different types of lighting and some metering stuff and being proactive, which is typically where we start because I think that's imperative. So my biggest thing for most people is you have to be able to see the image in your mind first, right? And then figure out the tools and techniques to capture that vision. If you don't do that, you're immediately behind the eight ball. Okay, you're having the camera take the photograph, you're looking at the picture, you're saying it's too light, it's too dark, I don't like this, I don't like that, and then you're correcting for it. So the proper way to do it is to see that picture in your mind and then figure out what tools and techniques you need to capture. So sit tight, we got about an hour and change to do this, and. Uh, I hope you enjoy it. What we're going to do is keep the questions to the end. Um, so as we start to get closer, uh, you know, give me a wave or stuff like that, or you know, give me a shirt pull, or stick your hand through the screen and tell me, okay, stop, because we won't have any time for questions. So away we go. And just let me make sure that that this is all working, right? Everybody can see those lenses. We're all pretty yeah. good. Just give me a thumbs up there, and okay, we're rocking through this. So why do I shoot Canon in the first place? Um, it's a huge system. I, I shot everything known to man, all Hasselblads like his and, and all the others beforehand and kind of just fit what I do, um, plus CPS. So we have um, a team behind us that seriously takes care of us, um, whether we're pros, whether we're amateurs, you know, we send the stuff in, bang, it comes right back. If we're doing trade shows, there's a Canon booth there and they're changing focusing screens for people, lens caps, eye caps, cleaning the sensors for free. And that support means a lot to us as working pros. So this is the CEO. Um, it's my little uh, my little snow macaque friend from Japan. Uh, he was he was there, and I threw the hat in the snow and just kind of uh, dripped the hat in. We masked it and popped it on his head there. But some people are like, "Hey, you know, his beard's better than yours." Maybe I don't know. So when we're photographing out in the wild, it's all different kinds of environments, which require all different types of clothing. So when I'm photographing bears in Alaska, I have a full set of chest waders on. I have the big tripod with the big 600 on there. And I have a backpack that has a lot more than I need just for me. So we're out in the wild. This particular one, we had a float plane drop us off. So I had to make sure that I had enough gear to um, maintain safety and have um, provisions if we got stuck there overnight. And you can see my pepper spray on the front which is probably more for unruly participants than it actually is for bears. <clears throat> so we're in the Falklands and here I go. It's a completely different environment, right? So I'm sealed up like in a hefty bag. I have all my rain gear on, even though it's not raining. So we have blowing salt spray. We have um, uh, crazy sand on the beaches and we're trying to keep that off of our person and our equipment. So if you look at the cover, 
even on my cameras, those mm -hmm. are fully encapsulated covers. This one's a think tank mm -hmm. hydrophobia and it completely covers the camera. You know, it's zipped in there, sealed in, so no sand will get in there at all. Normally, if I'm shooting in different environments, you'll see in a second, we have uh, covers to, you know, that will kind of uh, um, take care of the top of the camera and the lenses, but they're a little bit more open design. So we're in the Arctic, you know, minus 30 degrees, minus 40 doing polar bears and, you know, Arctic fox and some other crazy stuff up there. We, you know, we're dressed for success, right? So here we have the, you know, the crazy um, heat company gloves. I got a goose down parka with another layer underneath that and ball cloth is, you know, and all that kind of stuff. So again, you know, depending upon the environment that we're shooting, that's going to dictate the clothing that we're wearing. Um, it's imperative for me to prepare for the worst and hope for the best when we get to these locations. Oh this is Japan. God. And we just have uh, the lighter colors. These are covers. These are lens coat raincoats, and they're open in the back. So it's real cold out. The snow's not really too wet, and they work perfect for us. <clears throat> I'm up doing muskox, and uh, this was like, I, I think it was like, like, geez, I don't know, minus 10 degrees. But we're hiking uphill with snowshoes, so, you know, we're sweating as we're going up, so most of our clothing is off. In that bag on my back, that blue stuff sack, is that big orange goose down parka. Mm -hmm. So as soon as we stop... We have to throw that on immediately, otherwise that sweat's gonna freeze to our bodies. So here's, here's where we go proactive. So I'm in Bosque, New Mexico, right? Most people have heard about it if you do any wildlife photography and we're photographing the snow geese when they're taking off. So the group says, hey, Chads, we're gonna go to lunch. And I said, well, we're gonna stay here for a minute. I'm gonna, you know, I wanna get more of the birds taken off. So their concern to me was, yeah, but we're gonna get shadows. Well, I want those shadows. Right, those shadows for me are what make this makes this photograph. So we're trying to take a three-dimensional world and make it look three-dimensional on a two-dimensional plane. How do we do it? Well, we have to have light. And we have to have shadows. That's the only way we're going to get this depth perception. So I said, okay, you know, here's what we're going to do. The group said, all right, we'll stay. So my question to them is, what picture do you want to paint? Nothing exists. All the birds are sitting on the ground right? There's nothing there. Essentially, you have a blank canvas. So when the birds take off, do you want to make them look spatially separated with a wide angle? Do you want to compress them with a telephoto? Do you want to make look uh, normal, which is this? This is a uh, 24 to 70, close to 70 millimeters. Do you want to have all the birds in focus from front to back? Do you want to freeze the birds, blur the birds, blur the background? Again, it's a blank canvas, right? So see the picture in your mind and figure out the tools and techniques to capture that vision. So, of course, they were looking at me like a deer in the headlights, and they're saying, okay, what do you want to do? So I said, all right, I'm going to shoot at about 50 to 70 millimeters so the birds look spatially separated. I want to freeze all the birds, which to me means 25 hundredth of a second, right? And I want to get all the birds in focus from front to back with about a 50 millimeter lens of somewhere on F11. So I know to capture the picture the way I see it, right? We already defined it. I need a 50 millimeter lens. I need 25 hundredth of a second at F11. So how do I get there? Well, I could tell you this from years of experience, and you can do the same exact thing. Most white birds in sunlight, full sunlight, right, on a clear cloudless day, if you are at normal latitudes, they're going to be 1250 at F8 to 200 ISO. So when people ask, how do I meter? I didn't meter. I already know what it is. It's the same as it was last year. It's going to be the same next year. Every white bird in Florida on a sunny day is exactly the same exposure. So when you pick up your camera and your camera gives you some kind of erroneous reading, disregard it. You already know what it is. It could be a white seagull on the beach. It could be a white egret in a dark tree. I don't care. If that bird is in the same sunlight, it's the same exposure. So I put 1250 at F8 in the camera. Okay, but we already determined that I want 2500. So if I take 200 ISO and I double it to 400 ISO, now I have 2500 at F8. But I want F11. So I take 400 ISO, double it to 800 ISO, now I have the F11. So I'm shooting 800 ISO in the screaming sunlight. Why? Because I want 2,500 at F11 to capture the picture the way I see it in my mind. If I say, okay, I'm only going to shoot 200 ISO, right? Then I'm not going to get the same photograph. So for me, it's more important that I get the image that I want. And the noise is basically somewhat secondary. I can take the noise out, but I can never freeze the subjects or get that depth of, free, you know, depth of field back in the photograph. So I have two cameras next to each other. I got the 24 to 70 and a 16 to 35. So first I fire off this picture. Now those numbers are manually set in the other camera already before the birds take off. So there's the second picture. There's the third picture. It's all exactly the same exposure. It's all set in the camera. So I go pop, 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 let's go to lunch, right? So the more goal oriented you are, 
The more you think these things through ahead of time, the more consistently your image will be successful. Think it through, be proactive, don't be reactive. And here's another scenario. So this is a 600 with a 1.4, 840 millimeters. So I see all these birds coming in. There's nothing done to this that you don't see by eye. It's not enhanced or I didn't put extra birds, you know, in the scene or any of that stuff. But what I did do is say, okay, here's the composition I want. I want the reeds in the foreground, the bird sharp in the background, and enough depth of field to be able to discern all of it. Right? So what do I need? Well, here at 840 millimeters, my depth of field is shallow. So I need 25 hundredths of a second again to freeze those pintails because they're coming in like little rockets. And I need at least F16 so that you could see the reeds in the foreground and some of the birds in the background. So I locked the whole thing down on a tripod. I focus about midway where I think the birds are going to come in. I go to eight points around. And as soon as the birds start to fly through the viewfinder and hit that spot, it's the only time I'm depressing the shutter. So I might have fired off, I don't know, you know, bursts of with the 1DX, you know, maybe 14 frames a second. And I might have fired off 100 pictures, right, as they kept coming in. But all I have to do later is look through those particular images and pick what I want. The composition set, everything's determined beforehand. None of it is reactive. It's all setting it up proactive again, seeing the picture in my mind, figuring out what I want to do. Same scenario here, right? So this is down in Florida, the Blue Cypress. Now, how do I know the osprey is going to land there? Well, the nest is about 10 feet over to it, you know, to our left. So I've seen the bird land there numerous times. So I already figured out my exposure. I already figured out that I want to shoot this at 16 hundredths of a second. I already picked the lens choices. All of that is set manually into the camera so that nothing changes. Otherwise, if it was a dark bird coming in the frame, the picture would get light, right? Then I get a light bird, the picture goes dark. So I don't want to play, you know, let's throw the hand grenade and be close enough. I want to nail these things. So we all have live view now, right? We can just put the thing in live view, check the histogram, make sure nothing's clipped. Then when the bird gets there, we rip off the photographs. The one thing I do do with birds like this is I always leave a little extra room because the wings are always bigger than I think they are. And I end up cropping them a little bit. So I can always crop in a little, but you know, unless you got build a bird software, you can't really put that bird back together, right? But you can learn to meter off the midtone. So I can meter off the, uh, you know, the moss on the left. Set that in the camera and then pick it back up. And when the bird comes in, fire it off. So here, same thing, right? It's, it's all thought out ahead of time. Focus points are moved over to the right side. You're not in the center. But as the bird starts to come in, I can start to fire those pictures. And that's the only spot I'm going to fire a burst. The stuff to the left, the stuff to the right, that's not going to be successful for me. I don't need the bird's booty flying away, right? So there's just a small window of opportunity. That's where the light's best. That's where the background's best. That's the only spot I'm going to fire that burst. And then I can get these really crazy photographs. But again, I'm setting the parameters. I'm not letting the camera dictate to me. This was, it took over two decades to get this image. So this was just in June when we were photographing the loons. And I get this question all the time. How long did it take to get that? I don't know, 125th of a second or 20 years? You know, what do you, how do you figure it out? But it's, it's, you know, as nature photographers, a lot of it's fleeting moments. So we need the light to be right, the shutter speed to be right, the conditions to be right, to have the right focal length on the lens. All of those things have to come together in one fleeting moment for us to be able to take a successful photograph like this. But because I've been doing this a lot, right, I've been photographing those loons for 20 years, I can anticipate the behavior. So the more we know about the animal behavior, it definitely gives us a heads up. It gives us an advantage. And that's always what I'm looking for. So even if the conditions are not primary, you know, to, to the success of that particular image, I'm going to go out if it's raining so that I can observe and understand the behavior and when they're going to go to the nest, where they're going to land, which way the wind's going, so that when conditions are appropriate, I can make the best. This is with a polarizer. It's not going to work without the polarizer. And it does look like I shot it underwater, but I'm not. I'm standing on the boat with an R5 and a 24 to 105 millimeter lens with a polarizer. And as the bird starts to dive down deep into the green water, I'm firing off the pictures. Now, it's normally about one stop darker as soon as the bird goes underneath the water. So that's what I did. Same conditions here. You can even see the meniscus, right? That surface tension of the water between the mud puppy and the water. All these exposures are set in camera. So as soon as the bird starts, you know, thrashing around in the water and looks like it's going to start to come up, that's when I try and lock the focus and that's when I try and fire the pictures. Because once it comes up, 
I don't get the water dripping, right? I've already missed a lot of that decisiveness. And those are the little things that are going to make the biggest difference in our images. That's what's going to separate our pictures from other people's pictures. It's all about the small details, not the big ones. So how did I do this? Again, it's all manually set in the camera. So people are like, well, how do you meter that coming up out of the water? I don't. There's three of his buddies sitting on the beach in the same light. So I metered off that, and I tend to use spot metering. So I spot metered off that bird's chest, set it two stops above to make the white white, move my focus points over to the left side, and then as he was coming up out of the water, I just kept those focus points on him. So the exposure was already set in the camera, right? Now all I have to be concerned with is the aesthetics, and that's what's going to elevate our pictures. Same thing here, right? So we have these red lechwe in, in Africa. They jump 13 feet up in the air. And I would do the same because those little waterways are, uh, you know, filled with crocs. So I'm pretty sure you jump over them as well. But we can set those parameters up. You know, it's not serendipity, this stuff. I'm figuring out the exposures beforehand. Check it out when they're sitting in the water before they're doing anything. You know, put the thing in live view. You can check it with a live histogram, right? So exposed to the right, make sure the highlights aren't clipped. Have all those parameters set in the camera. So when the decisive moment does happen, you can just concentrate on the task at hand. You don't want to have that once in a lifetime moment ago. No, you know, I shot it and it's two or three stops over or underexposed. So I'm in Yellowstone. I know the fox is going to jump. I've seen it. 25 years we've been photographing them. You know, they stop, right? They start to go back on their haunches. Their head goes left and right. The ears go forward, you know, and then he cocks his head a little bit, leans down, and then he's going to go. So that's not the time to go, you know, I think I'm going to put a converter on the lens, right? It's a decisive moment. Now, ideally, I would have preferred to move to the left, but I'm pretty sure the participants who were paying me to be there wouldn't appreciate it if I moved in front of them. So this is where we were, and this is what we got. But again, the shutter speed, the f-stop, the exposure is all set in the camera ahead of time. There's over a million views on this picture, and people go, it's no way you did that. It's in Photoshop, you know, and it's not. So, you know, we did the Homer thing for, I don't know, six, seven years in a row, shot 100,000 pictures of eagles, and it's a 300 to eight, and this one picture, they happen to be basically in the same fill plane that all came together. Can I do it again? I don't have a clue if I can do it again. But I already got this picture, and I don't need to duplicate this picture. I'm on already looking for the next one. Now, the little fish in there, to be 100% honest, we were throwing them fish back when we could do that on the beach. So one eagle picked up the fish, the other ones took off to try and uh, get him to drop it, and that's what this is all about. So this is Snowy Owl, Jones Beach, right, New York. 2004, I spent 200 hours photographing snowy owls with wild game, okay, before all the baiting became popular and people were feeding them, you know, whatever they can buy in a pet store. So it's a 4028 with a 2X. I'm laying on my belly. It took me two hours to crawl up to this guy eating this owl. And uh, somebody just walks up to me, says, what are you doing? And the bird flushes. So I'm like, Ugh! So all I do is lean, you know, to my left as fast as I can, fired off two shots. One was in focus. And that's this one. So the composition is not the best that I could, you know, ever hope for, but it still works and it's still enough action. And the picture is tack, tack sharp. So we make the most of what we have. But this came about because I spent so much time with those four owls that I knew where they were going to be, depending upon the wind, depending upon, you know, the conditions. And, and we could predict, um, you know, that part of it. So when we do go to locations, I try and make a mental storyboard, you know, or some people I tell them just write that stuff down. So what is it that you want to photograph when you're there? Well, you want to do headshots, right? Portraits. You want to do environmentals. You want to do action. You know, you want to get group shots, cub shots, this, that, you know, whatever it is that you want to do. If you write that down, you're meant to make a mental storyboard. And the day before you go, man, I got killer pictures of the bears, you know, shaking their heads. Okay. Well, I already got a bunch of those. Let me concentrate on what I don't have right? I got a lot of environmentals. Let me concentrate on portraits. Let me do more verticals. So each night, if you look at that, you'll walk away from each encounter or each, you know, week that you're on location with much more diversity than if you just shot everything willy-nilly, right? So I'm goal-oriented. Here's where the light's best. I'm going to wait for the cubs to hit that spot. If something happens behind me, well, okay, you know, I could pull a Hail Mary and try and shoot that. But if I see the bear coming and the light is different, I'm going to go over there and I'm going to meter for that light before the subject even gets there. It's a fallacy that you have to meter the exactly for the subject. If I place any one of those values accurately where it's supposed to be on the histogram, all the other ones fall into place. So I don't have to meter the, you know, the bear per se. You know, I can meter the green in the background. And if it's lighter or darker than a midtone, that's how it'll be rendered. 
So here, right? We're in Connecticut River State Park. It's on uh, Long Island again. So we're actually photographing Osprey and this turkey steps into this God-given light. So I was like, you've got to be kidding me. I couldn't have painted a photograph any better than this. So I have this camera with me, the longer lens, and then I have a one to 400. So I just transpose the exposure that's in the 600 camera to the one to four. And then I shoot this. Those exposures are exactly the same. So your camera is going to see something else because it sees darker, lighter tones. And if you're in automatic mode, then you're going to play, okay, here's my compensation again. So every time you change the tonal values in the meter pattern, you zoom in, you zoom out, go horizontal, vertical, you're playing photo roulette. So you're sitting there playing oot, doot, 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 and you're spinning the compensation wheel to get back to the exposure you already knew. So if the light is fixed and it's unchanging, it's much better for you to do manual. And then if you want to make the picture lighter or darker, just adjust one of the variables, right? You have stop shutter speed or ISOs. But if I send these pictures to the magazine, everyone is identical. Exposures are the same because nothing's changing. And that's my goal. So we all have zoom lenses, right? So this is the two to 400 with the built-in one four. So I'm shooting this about 400 millimeters, luckily from across the river. These two guys are having a little grapple here over, you know, whose fish that is. So we do this and then I just engage the one to four and then I could shoot a tighter shot. So everybody used to shoot fixed lenses, but now with the versatility, you know, and the sharpness and all that stuff with these zoom lenses, man, we, we have a whole nother world. And now we have mirrorless at our disposal where what we see in the viewfinder is what we get. So all these metering classes and, you know, spot metering, evaluative, RGB, all that stuff is, is basically kind of sitting on the back burner right now. We have live histograms. I mean, how could you beat that? You know, it's unbelievable. Now you have focus points that track the eyes. So beforehand, where we physically had to move the focus point to stay on the bear's head, you know, which you had to be pretty adept at doing. Um, now you don't have to do that. You know, these cameras are so good, they just stay on the bear. So I maintain composition, the focus points moves. I could check my exposure in real time and we rock them, you know. So it's, it's a whole nother world. So this is Spirit Bear in British Columbia, right? So again, just to kind of reiterate, I'm doing horizontals. And then I'm like, okay, now I'm going to concentrate on verticals. So I'm constantly moving things around. And with nature photography, particularly wildlife, you can't say, hey, I'm going to go back tomorrow and shoot the same thing. It's just not going to be there. Nine times out of 10, it's not going to be there. You know, unless you got something sitting on a nest. You know, but that log, that collapsed. So you go back next year and oh, I'll get another bear walking down the log again. Nope, it's gone. So make the most of what you have. You know, and I tell everybody, if you're in a scenario and the subject is cooperative, come away with at least four different photographs, a horizontal, a vertical, close up and a full length. Maximize your potential. Don't just shoot 50 of the same thing, pull one and you got 49 going in the trash. As the subject gets closer, I get lower. Right? I want a much more intimate photograph, so I'm trying to get down on their level. And you can see that right foot forward, and I do that on purpose. I just like angles in my photograph. The more triangles in the pictures, the more I like them. It just has a graphic sense. So there's an implied motion. The body's leaning forward, you know, which rather than just a static upright picture. I can guarantee that the, the pink salmon is not too happy about the whole thing, but, you know, it's a pretty cool photograph. So here. The snowshoe hares in Yellowstone are one of the most elusive things you can ever see. You'll see tracks everywhere, but in 20 years, I've only seen like two scenarios and I only had one real good opportunity where that snowshoe hare um, allowed us to be with it. And this particular one stayed there for 40 minutes. So I shot slow pictures when he wasn't moving to streak the snow, jack the shutter speeds up to freeze him when he was doing stuff. I did 4K video, horizontals, verticals. I mean, I did everything I possibly could. And it was just a remarkable encounter. So, oops, he got me. You know, so I've done triptychs. We're here, no evil, see no evil. Did you get that? Hair, no evil. So anyway, um, it's pretty funny stuff, but, but we got all those pictures. The, you know, muskox, right? I try not to get subjects overlapping, and I look for eye detail in a lot of the pictures. Now, a lot of people will also shoot pictures where they don't really care about detail in the snow. They blow it out and make high-key photographs, and that's okay. But for me, it's real important. I want all the detail possible in the images. And I'm real critical about pushing to the right and not trying to clip those highlights. We do a close-up, right? So again, it's a big lens, right? This is a 600 of this bison covered in this hoarfrost. And then I said, wow, you know, the eye is, is just unbelievably intriguing. So what happens if I put the 2X on, right? So now I have this picture that just, I mean, it draws you in. You know, you're just pulled right in there. So a tip for you too is if you're going to use a converter, 
Try and stop down one extra stop and the pictures will be much sharper. So if I have an F4 lens and I put a 2X, I have F4, 5, 6, F8. Well, F8 is gonna give me a much sharper picture, right? Uh, somewhat. If I go to F11, now it's gonna be even sharper because I'm shooting more through the central portion of the converter so I don't get the edge problems. So with the 1.4, it's not as critical. And if you're shooting a crop camera, you're shooting more through the central portion of the picture. So that's not a big deal either. But if you're shooting wide open with converters, it's much, you're going to have much better resolution if you close down at least one stop. So the fox in Yellowstone, beautiful, sensuous snow. I mean, it was, it was gorgeous. And the fox is extremely cooperative. So the fox jumps and I rip off 14 frames a second. Brat, right? And then I put it together in Photoshop. Now, the crazy thing is... See the way he's jumping? Well, if you go back, he's going one way, and I assembled it this way. And some people said, you know, um, well, you could do that because he jumps left to right, but what if you flipped it? So if you flip it, it doesn't say Adidas on its T-shirt. Nobody could tell, right? But the picture has a completely different connotation if I do that and that. So it's funny because 70% of the people will like it one way, 30% will like it the other. So it's just a cultural thing, I guess, where we lead, you know, read left to right. But it is a pretty cool photograph, and Canon purchased the rights to the panel for uh, their corporate office in New York. So we got the swan, and I'm always telling people, just like when you do landscapes, with wildlife, we want foreground, middle ground, background. So that snow on the bottom, that didn't happen by accident. That's in there because it draws the viewer's eye through the photograph. Now, what I do have to do is wait for the swan to come closer to me, right, so that the head isn't being intersected by that, that little horizon line. And then here, this is Japan. So I'm laying on my belly with a 24 to 70. Before I went to Japan, I'm looking at photographs, you know, trying to emulate the style and seeing what it is that, uh, that they see and how they photograph. So this is a spot in Hokkaido, um, uh, Lake Kishiro. So I go over there, lay on my belly with the 24 to 70. I think I was at, uh, I don't remember, maybe F8, somewhere around there. You know, with a high shutter speed, and I'm just waiting. So I got four points, so autofocus in the center. I know I got somewhat depth of field, and I'm waiting. And lo and behold, the whooper swan um, flaps its wings, and I was praying that I didn't cut the edges of its feathers off, you know, and I got extremely lucky. And uh, it's one of my favorite photographs. I put this up, everyone went out of their minds, and there's a lot of print requests for it. But if you know Japan, that definitely looks like Japan, with the trees and the mountains and the swans in the foreground, and nothing is clipped. There's not one pixel in that whole image that's clipped. This is the same location, right? But different. So that swan that's in the water was not there. I looked and I saw him coming way from the left, like 50 yards from the left. And I'm like, okay, what am I going to do? Where am I going to put that swan? So I walked down the, the lake shore until I found that opening between the swans. And I said, okay, when he comes, that's where I'm going to nail him. So I fired off a picture beforehand, made sure my exposure was correct, put the focus point where I think that swan's head's going to be, and then when the swan got there, I took the picture. So again, it's being proactive rather than reactive. See the picture beforehand, figure out what you want to do. We're photographing walruses in the Bering Sea in Alaska, and I did this like tens of you know, different ways. So I'm up on a cliff, there's thousands of these guys up there, and it's like, okay, what do we do with this? You know, how do we make a semblance of this? So the one that I got with like, you know, there's actually a couple of thousand walruses in there. I figure I'm going to make a thousand piece jigsaw puzzle and drive some little kid out of his mind. Um, but, but I did this a number of different ways. I shot this at F16 to have all of them in focus. And then I shot it at F4 with the big lens. And I just kept going back and forth, left and right, looked for something that was kind of an anomaly, something that was different, that your eye could gravitate to. And he would be sharp and then the other ones would be just softer surrounding elements. So mix it up again. You know, think what it is that you want to do. We're in, um, in the Camargue in France photographing these, these horses. And I wanted a somewhat, you know, like 100 millimeters to, to maybe, you know, 70 millimeters, somewhere in there. You know, I wanted it to just seem natural. I didn't want to shoot the horses from real far away if I could help it. So I was shooting with a 24 to 105 and a 1 to 400 for 99% of this stuff. Um, there's more mosquitoes there than I've ever seen in my life. And they're the size of hummingbirds. So if you ever sign up for a workshop and I ask you for, uh, for your blood type, you'll understand why if we go to this spot. So we're in Yellowstone. It's like a blizzard. You could just about make out these wolves. So I tell the guys with me, hey, you guys got to shoot that. And they're like, look, we're not going to see any detail on the wolf. 
It's not about detail on the wolf. It's about six wolves howling in a blizzard. It's a story, right? So, you know, we shoot it. It doesn't look like this on the back of the camera. It looks kind of flat, right? Lack of contrast. And then before he went to dinner, I ran to the room, pumped this up in uh, Photoshop a little bit, came to dinner and showed him that. And they said, man, I should have shot that. Well, yeah. Yeah, if you don't shoot it, game over, right? But if you do shoot it, it's virtual money anyway. It doesn't cost you anything. Just more pixels on a card, which you can delete or format anyway. So, you know, fire it away. You know, check it out. But think about what it is you're doing. I don't care if I can't see individual hairs in this particular photograph. So a raptor, right? Again, the more behavior I know, the better off it is. So there's a white-tailed sea eagle in Japan with a Stellar's sea eagle in behind him. And I'm only photographing the Stellar's on that side of the boat because that's where the light's best. That's where I'm not going to get a shadow from one wing onto the other. Now, how do I know when they're going to take off, right? Well, if you photograph raptors, it's a pretty darn heavy bird, right? So the first thing it has to do when it's going to take off is lift its wings straight over its head as high as it can and pull down super hard to get that loft, that initial loft, right? So that it flies. You know, if it's sitting on a branch and it just makes a little flutter, it's going to fall off. So it wants to fly. So as soon as you see the bird look up in the air to check air traffic control. It sorts to do a little squat down. The talons twitch sometimes. That's when you want to fire. Not when you see the bird jump because you're already behind the eight ball, right? So if you got that motor drive, use it to your ability. You know, as soon as he looks like he's going to start to go, brat, you know, and then you're off the hammer. I mean, it's literally five or six pictures that you're going for. The rest of it is a waste, you know? So the guy above actually threw me the little bone in the background, you know, with that stellar seagull, you know, but but you can do this consistently if you know what to look for. So the, we saw the crazy fox, you know, he's, he's setting up, you he know, he's going to pounce, you know, and again, we got the fast shutter speeds and all that stuff. And, uh, you know, you get him buried up to his eyeballs. So wings over water, this is back in the Homer days. It's a 70 to 200, right? So all of this is, is kind of set up. We were cheating back then, you know, we were throwing fish to the birds. So I had my flash set up at, you know, in manual mode at half the distance with a better beamer. Um, actually quarter distance because that's two stops fill flash shutter speed f stop all of that's in there you know and i told the guy's wife hey you know time for her to throw the fish and he's like well i didn't tell her i'm like oh well you're gonna have a tough night <laughs> you know so anyway he says I, I said i want the fish 20 feet away how do you know where that is so on your lenses there's a scale right so i set the lens to 20 feet looked along the water when it got sharp that's where i wanted the fish so i set the flash up i set everything up you know, it's kind of like fish in a barrel, literally. And all we're waiting for is the birds to come by. Now, the faster the birds come, right, the more my shutter speed goes up. The closer they get, the faster the shutter speed goes up for two reasons. They're closer and a little bit more magnified. And now we have these crazy cameras with more megapixels, so it's more important. More pictures are ruined because the shutter speeds are slower than they are because they're wrong f-stops. So same thing here. I got the snow flying, kicking up. The exposure set in the camera beforehand. Right? I don't have to worry about it being over underexposed. All I have to do is worry about keeping the focus point on the bugger as he's coming into land. You know, and then brat, and then I'm off the hammer. You know. So here, you know, we're in the Galapagos. So you can you can do this consistently. You know, it takes a lot of practice. You're not gonna wake up and say, okay, you know, I can nail these things just as they're coming in the water. And these things are diving in so fast you're physically pulling the camera down to keep up with them. Now I can get that shot sort of consistently where he is exactly in the frame. I need to crop a little bit. There's no way I can say, okay, I'm going to put him, you know, perfectly in the bottom right third and, you know, and that kind of stuff. So we use a little bit of a, uh, um, you know, a, a shorter focal length so that I know I'm going to end up cropping it. This is in Yellowstone. It's, it's one picture of a lifetime. You know, we tracked a little bugger for a quarter of a mile. I saw him laying in the snow. All, you know, everything's covered with snow except this little mound on his back. He's across the river. I said, I think that's the cat. Nobody's seen it for a week, you know? So I grabbed the guy's binoculars who were with me and, you know, we just sat there and had lunch and the cat got up and started to walk. So I walked a quarter mile down where it frequents and they do the same thing on the Madison River all the time. You know, they have learned to hunt mallards. So they sit on the branches over the river when the, you know, the ducks or waterfowl swim by, they dive in. So we got this guy completely diving off the snowbank, wrestling with the thing in the water and then walking up the snowbank. You know, and we got extremely lucky because as soon as he started to walk up, by that time, there was a lot of people there, you know, not just me photographing it. It stopped and looked right back at us. And that was a gift from above. You know, it's just you got the eye contact, the whole thing. Now, for me, it was important. The exposure was set in the camera again beforehand. 
There's not one pixel that's clipped. And I purposefully did not clip that shadow because I think that's integral to the composition, right? Nor did I have, you know, 1200 millimeters on the camera to, to just get that. But I think it's important to have environment in your pictures. If I had one photograph to take, it's not gonna be a frame filling image. It's going to be where the subject is typically about 25% of the viewfinder. So it has a sense of context and has a sense of story. So again, you know, learning different behaviors and stuff. This was, uh, you know, where we do a white pelican shoot. So I've learned that white pelicans open those hoops, you know, like a basketball and they cooperatively hunt. The, the other pelicans will dive in, the brown ones individually, you know, and eventually they get cataracts. These cooperatively hunt. They all stick their heads underwater together. They all open up the basketball hoop and the fish that's frightened swims into somebody's hoop. And then they harass each other and try and get them to drop it. You know, so the guy above the guy with the hoop open has a, a sucker in there that's probably three pounds. You know, and the crazy thing is once their head's underwater and they catch a fish, if they can't orient it correctly in the beak, they'll drown. So they have to let it go, you know, or reposition it. So you see them struggling to try and reposition the fish you know, and then they swallow it and they, they just drift downstream because now they're, you know, three, four pounds heavier and it's more difficult for them to fly. This is a uh, giant southern petrels. It's in the Falkland Islands. So I'm not one to try and just shoot these static photographs. I'm looking for peak points of interest, decisive moments. So I notice when these waves come that the birds get tossed about, you know, and it looked way more dramatic for me. So that's when I'm firing the burst. If the wave wasn't there, I'm not shooting anything. So here, I followed this steamer duck in the Falcons for hundreds of yards back and forth on the beach, just trying to photograph it when it crested the wave. You know, everybody likes to, to hunt pictures in Africa, and yeah, they're really dramatic and, you know, um, emotional. The other stuff, you know, once he grabs it, I'm not shooting that stuff anymore. Nobody wants those pictures, and they're just kind of nasty, you know, but you want the subject parallel to the camera, so my depth of field works, you know, shutter speeds are high and all that kind of stuff. And again, in Africa, your basic exposure, right? Guess what it's going to be? 1,000 F8 at 400 ISO. It's the same thing every day. So this is a loon with a mud puppy, right? So the first time I saw that, I was like, what is that, ET? What is that thing eating? But the exposure was set in the camera beforehand. So when he pops up, all I started doing was ripping off pictures. Just, brrr, you know, firing off. And what we do here is I meet her off the bank because the bank is mid-tone. It's all trees. Right, so if I meet in my mid-tone and the, the subject's in the same light, everything's perfect. So here, here's that foot that's furthest away from the camera, forward again. The bear is closer to the camera, so I'm lower. And I love this kind of oval that's in the photograph because it keeps the viewer's eye in the picture. You're, you're not, your mind is not wandering outside the frame. It completely stays in there. And you just have this, you know, this oval where your eye just keeps circling around. So we have side lighting, okay? My whole career, was, again, was based on taking a three-dimensional world and making it look three-dimensional on a two-dimensional plane. How do we do it? Well, you got to have shadows. So that's what gives this sense of depth perception. If you look at the sand, there's all this, you know, depth in the sand, texture. If you look at the penguin itself, it looks round because there's a slight shadow on that one side. You can see all the pin feathers because the light's coming from the side. So I can position myself relative to the light and the background, and then... I basically have to wait for the subject to orient itself correctly to the light. And then I take the pictures. So it's all set beforehand. Look at this. The light's like 90 degrees to the camera. But the reason you see all that depth perception and it looks like that penguin can be plucked right off that image is because of the, the shadows, right? So if you understand Gentoos and you photograph them a zillion times, they're extremely curious. And if you lay down, they will walk right up to you. And as they walk, they do this lean or arch all the way from the left side to the right side. So I wasn't just shooting as he was walking. Each time he would lean to the apex left or right, I would fire off the pictures. And then the guy above was kind enough to throw this rainbow in there for us. This is in Iceland. It's 11 o'clock at night. And it looks like a studio portrait, right? But we're just watching everything. The slight tilt of the head, all that stuff, trying to get on eye level. You know, it's like when I used to do corporate portraits and annual reports, you know, so you, you have to understand what it is that the magazine is looking for or what's the goal of the annual report, right? So if you got an article on pit bulls and they said, okay, your goal is to make pit bulls look demure, well, you're not going to stand up and look down at the pit bull. You're going to lay on your belly and look up at him and take those photographs because even if it's the happiest pit bull in the world, the viewer is going to get a different connotation and that's your job. You're a communicator. So what is it that you want to communicate? 
right? All that stuff goes into play. It's not just that we're firing off photographs. So look at the side lighting here, right? It's almost coming from behind. But you can see all the detail in the chest because the light's hitting the water and then reflecting back. So for me, again, the picture has a lot more depth perception. You're not going to photograph landscapes in the middle of the day for the same reason. So look here, right? It's almost rimlet, slightly backlit. This was in June. It was beautiful light, but I have to wait for the bird to cock its head so the red eye lights up. So with the loons, that's the only time I fire off the picture. When I see that red eye, I mean, you could, you know, you're looking at it just like I am. It immediately grabs your eye. And then the lighting just, you know, puts it over the top. The other reason that the chest isn't blown out is we have what's called angle of incidence and angle of reflectance. What does that mean? Well, there's a lot of guys who are big proponents of, hey, I'm going to point my shadow at the subject. If you do that and all the light hits a white subject, it gets bounced straight back into the camera. So in order for you to see the detail in the white, what are you going to do? You're going to make the picture darker. Well, what's going to happen to the shadows? That's going to get even darker. So if I have the light coming from one side or the other, the light hits that, the angle of incidence comes off on a slight angle. Not all of the light comes back into the lens. I don't have to close the camera down as much, which ensures detail on my highlights and my shadows are brighter. So I get the best of both worlds. The worst thing we could do in the digital world is take dark things and make them lighter. So look at the side lighting here, right? Crazy dramatic. So people might say, yeah, but the other side's in shadow. Well, it's okay. You know, it's a subjective art form anyway. But for me, this picture is, is, you know, is provocative. So here's the side lighting as well, right? It's coming from the right shoulder. But what's happening? Well, the light's bouncing off the snow, filling in the deep shadow on the left side of that, that big horn ram. Now, remember I said it's attention to detail. So if you look at the horns, the only time I was really firing off those photographs is when there was separation between the horns and the body. It's not by accident right? I don't want those overlaps. It's the little details that are going to make the biggest differences in your images. Screaming Eagle. You know, it's a big lens. It's a 600 with a 2X in Alaska. Trying to get on his level. He's sitting on a log, you know, and we're photographing, you know, when he's, when he's screaming. But yeah, the, the light falls off on the right side and I could open it up and post a little bit, but then it's going to get a little noisy and all the other stuff, you know, and there's enough detail in the highlights that I think the picture works this way. So look at the U on the hill. I could have shot it from the left, you know, not so much from the right because the hill was there. So I just actually walked across the street for two reasons. First, I wanted the side lighting. And second of all, if I'm, I'm under the cliff shooting right up, I don't want to see the bottom of the U. So if I back off and use a slightly longer focal length, I'm negating the angle. Now, again, all I have to do is wait for the sheep to cock her head to the light. And if you look at the pupil, you can see the iris, right? So that's what we're looking for. As soon as I get the catch light, I can see the brown iris. That's when I'm going to take those photographs. An interesting thing is where I position that in the frame. So if I change nothing, but just where I position the sheep, you have a different feeling. If I put the sheep higher in the frame, it looks like it's up high on the cliff and there's a lot of cliff below. If I put him in the bottom of the frame, looks like he's low on the cliff and there's a big cliff above. Still in the same spot, but the picture has a different sense of communication. And you as the photographer have to understand that. This is in Africa. It's um, a 500 with a 1.4, so 700 millimeters. And the reason I put that much focal length on there was above this image, there's um, less of the wildebeest and you start to see more of the grass, right? So all I wanted to do was kind of, you know, force the viewer's eye to stay within that frame again. And the picture works even if it's bright sunlight because there's so much dust in the air that it kind of uh, diffuses it a little bit. So it knocks the contrast down. Side lighting. It's not just on the ground, it's in the sky. So the reason that we shoot these crazy sunsets and the skies look so dramatic is because of shadows, right? So the light's popping from the right, coming across the, you know, the cloud, and it's making those shadows in the clouds, which makes it look graphic. So here, same thing, side lighting, 90 degrees to the left of the camera. Look at it. But you could see all the texture and the granularity in the snow because it's side lit. Same thing here. This is a guy from uh, Planet Earth or BBC, you know, with a, a red camera and a giant two to 400 cross country skiing all over Yellowstone. So look at the texture in the snow, right? Look at all the depth and detail. And it's because it's not coming straight over my shoulder. Polar bear. I shouldn't tell you, this was shot at 200 millimeters laying on my belly in the Arctic, right? But look at the side lighting, look at the texture, look at the detail, you know? It's because the light is not coming straight over my shoulder. Same thing here, right? So here's the loons again. 
So if the light was coming straight from the right and hitting the chest of the loon first, I'd have to shut down and all the, the dark parts would be darker. But because the light's coming from a little bit of a higher angle and not really nailing that chest straight on over my shoulder, I can get detail throughout the whole picture. And you can see the catch light in his eye. The light's not that high above the horizon. Same thing here. Look at that. Crazy detail. Right? There's a little shadow. It's still kind of bright enough where you can see everything. But we're getting low and the picture has, again, depth perception. Same thing with the bear. Light's coming off to the left. So I want to see two eyes if possible. So I wait for the bear, the cock its head, and then we can take the picture. Right? Here it's completely top lit. So it's still side lit. Side lit doesn't necessarily mean left or right. It just means off camera axis. So top lighting is still side lit. So you can see the top of the egret is brighter than the bottom of the egret. Right? And that's what we have to make sure, that we're not clipping the tops. So I'm standing in screaming bright sunlight, and the egret is in the shade. Now, most people will tell you, sunny 16, well, you know, the sun's at 10, 2 o'clock. That's time to go home. You know, the sun's too bright. You can't get any photographs. Well, if you look at the catch light in the eye, it's almost dead center at the top of the eye. You know, maybe it's 11 o'clock. Maybe it's a little bit off to the left. But the lighting is perfect, right? So I just have to wait for the bird to cock its head slightly so the eye lights up, and then I can shoot it. And you already know the exposure. I told it to you. It's another part of a white bird in the sunlight. It's 1250 at F8, 200 ISO. Boom, done. You got a white bird and it's going to fly, go to 400 ISO. So now you got 2500 at F8 at 400 ISO. If your camera doesn't have the same dynamic range as the newer cameras, maybe you got to shut down one third of a stop more. So you go to 1600 or you go to, you know, um, 3200, you know, at F8 if you're at 400 ISO. But it's consistent. And you all have metadata. And if you went through the hard part of figuring out the correct exposures one day, just look at the metadata and understand, hey, this worked today. Well, then it's going to work tomorrow. If it's the same lighting and the same subjects, game on. You already did the work. So there's harp seals in Quebec. They drop you off with a helicopter on an ice floe, and you step to a breathing hole like I did, and you fall through the ice up to your wake and, uh, waist, and it's a pretty crazy feeling. But it's really cool. It's one of the coolest things I ever did. This guy is just born. He's still wet with the amniotic fluid. But it's shorter lenses, and we're exposing for the white. And if you understand how all this metering stuff works, and you're pushing the histogram to the right but not clipping it, white becomes easy. White on white is no more difficult than anything else. You just don't want to push it off the right. What throws the tizzy for everybody is they don't understand that it's the meter pattern that we use to determine exposure. It's the priority modes that we use to change the variables, right? So meter pattern, meaning spot metering, center weighted metering, you know, evaluative, RGB, all that stuff. Aperture priority, shutter priority, P for professional, all that stuff is just changing a variable based upon the meter pattern that you're using. So if I already took the hard part and figured out the correct exposure, I don't want the camera to change it. So if I zoom in and I fill it with a darker part of the frame, yet everything is in the same light, the camera in automatic mode is going to tell me, oop, it's dark, I'm going to make it light. Then you're going to apply compensation to change it. Then you're going to go horizontal and change the percentage of light and dark in the viewfinder, and now go back to altering the compensation to get back to the same exposure you knew was correct 10 minutes ago. It's the tail wagging the dog. So we're photographing uh, deer, and we come across this fawn laying in bright screaming sunlight in the grass. It's not hidden at all, but it's just basically born. So my car is not that far away. I told the guys with me, hey, go to my car, get the reflectors and diffusers. So we're actually holding up a 60-inch round diffuser to kind of put the, the uh, fawn in shadow, and then I have a slight gold reflector. And we only did it for, for I said, like five minutes max, and we're out of here. You know, the fawn didn't really care, but mom's over there, and I don't need to, you know, upset everybody in the wildlife and stuff like that. You know, there, of course, is always one pe person in the crowd who says, can we pick it up and move it into the flowers? No, we can't do that. You know, if you're in the supermarket with your kid and somebody comes over, can I pick your kid up and put him in the shopping aisle, you know, with the cereal? Pretty sure you're going to say no. So I don't know why everybody wants to move everything, but, you know, it's a pet peeve. We're not doing that and we're not going, you know, making noises and everything else to try and uh, get the stuff to look at you. So juxtapositions. We have light and dark, ebony and ivory, whatever you want to call it. So I'll show this and people go, hey, you know, if you got lower, it'd be better. Well, I don't know if it'd be better. It would be different. It would also overlap the shadow, right? So I actually went up one level on the boat because these ravens and stuff kept going back and forth. And I like the shadows in the pictures along with the white and dark. So I'm exposing the picture as bright as I can to make sure I'm not clipping the highlights, which makes the raven brighter. And then all in post have to do in post is essentially make the whites a little bit uh, 
deeper to pull out the detail, but I don't have to make the Raven lighter. The birds are close, fast shutter speeds, right? Boom. So I'm shooting this guy at 25 hundredths of a second, right? Opportunities. They're just, you know, once we start to do like backlighting and everything. So I'm in the Arctic, the temperature drops to minus 30 in the morning and we get the glow happening. And it's the only time it's ever happened. And I've been there, again, over two decades every year to photograph polar bears. So the gentleman who was with me got this. He entered it in the Travel Channel and won uh, the grand prize of $15,000. So not too bad. Paid for his trip and then some. Um, but it's an awesome picture. It's a once-in-a-lifetime experience. And it's not about cramming the subject in the frame, right? It's about the polar bear in its environment. That's what tells the story. Same thing here. So we're doing backlighting. So with backlighting, we expose for the highlights and just let the subjects fall off, right? So again, backlighting, right? And this is really quick with live view. If your camera has live view, you could just pop it on with live histogram, check the exposure to make sure that the highlights in the background are not pushed up against the right and shoot the pictures. Now, when we're doing silhouettes, think about this. What is a silhouette? It's just a graphic representation of the subject. So you want to make sure that it's clearly delineated to the viewer. If they overlap, you know what it is, but the viewer is not. It's going to look like a two-butted loom, right? So I want separation between all those elements. And you have it between the rocks, you have it between the rock and the grass, and you certainly have it between the two looms, right? So all that, again, that exposure is determined in camera, and I'm looking for specific things before I depress the shutter. Same thing here. Again, so we got this little juxtaposition of the, the giraffe and the tree. So I'm having the driver, I said, go left, go right, back up, do this. He goes, what are you trying to do? I said, I'm trying to put the giraffe right in the middle of that tree. He goes, well, that would have helped like five minutes ago. <laughs> and then he was right. But anyway, so we got the picture. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of cool to look at. I don't know what I'll do with it, but it's pretty neat the way, the way it worked out. So backlighting, rim lighting, right? So we exposed for the, for the rim light. Now, the reason the monkey's all lit up in the foreground is all that backlighting was bouncing off a big snowbank and it was lighting up his face. So it was, it was conducive to taking the photograph. Here's a point of interest. If the light's coming over your shoulder and it's full sunlight, right? And then you turn around and you shoot a backlit subject that's lit with the same sunlight and all you want is that rim light, don't change the exposure. Don't listen to what the camera's telling you. The camera's going to see all the dark and make it light. But if you just spin around, it's the same sunlight hitting the back of that monkey as hitting, you know, behind the monkey, right? So all I have to do, or, you know, behind me. So I just expose for the same light, bam. And then you get that cool rim light, you know, where you're, you don't really, the subject's in silhouette, but you just get the light around it like that, right? So I completely face the other way, set the exposure for the sunlight, full sunlight, and then just spun around and shot this because all I'm exposing for is the rim light. Now it's really cool with mirrorless cameras because again, what you see is what you get, right? So you just go, hey man, I want that. And you make the picture 10 stops darker than you normally would, you know, boom, shoot it. But it's really cool stuff. You know, normally when you're doing this, the light is low on the horizon, not so low that you're picking up flare, but basically somewhere behind the subject, you know, and you're ripping them off. So silhouettes again, you know, crazy story. We're in Jasper, the moose steps into the water. And what ended up happening is a lot of the guys with me had big lenses that they paid a lot of money for. So they're shooting close-ups of the moose. And some of them are opening up so they see detail in the moose. And they get a beautiful moose with a white background. Right? The other guy's exposed for the, the background, and then they get some color and, and, you know, and a moose. So I shot this with a 70 millimeter. And I showed them this, and they were like, where were you? The guy was right next to you. You guys all had tunnel vision. So it's not all about, hey, I got this giant lens. For the rest of my life, all I'm going to see is 600 millimeters. We got all these lenses at our disposal, and that's why I'm telling you, see the picture in your mind? Just pick the tool to capture that vision. Now, when I look at this, Okay, it's important for me to make sure that the head is in silhouette and I can see the dewlap and I can see the antlers. That says moose. But what I don't like about the picture, and I'm sure none of you realize this, is it's a two-legged moose, right? You don't see the other two legs. So some of the people in the group are like, hey, why don't you just take the legs off the other moose picture and stick them on, on this moose? And I'm like, I'm not going to do that. But again, you know, it's the little things and, and uh, you know, it's critical. Falkland Islands, right? I've been there 14 trips. So there's one spot on Sea Lion Island where at dusk, the penguins will always march back, you know, close to the lodge and the rookery. So I said to the guys, look, we got some cool sunset pictures. It's getting real dark. Let's go get silhouettes because they're going to hit the top of this hill. Now, I had no way of knowing that those ethereal god rays are going to be there, but I'm certainly happy that they were. 
you know, and again, it's once in a lifetime kind of crazy pictures, you know. So here, starburst again. So here's a point of interest. If you have an even bladed aperture, like an eight bladed aperture, you get eight rays. If you have an odd bladed aperture, you get twice as many. So if you have nine, you'll get 18. If you have 10, you'll have 10. Eight, you'll have eight, and so on. But, you know, you're running around right at dusk to try and pick a pinhole. So you only get this refraction of these starbursts, you know, if you're shooting F-16, F-22 kind of thing. And usually if they touch a surface or it's a small point source of light, it doesn't work on overcast days, um, you know, things like that where it's diffused. But here's a, another one, right? So this is an older lens. It's a little eight-point star. That's the pot that they boiled all the penguins in the Falkland Islands. And again, you know, I got lucky and those birds were in there. So the next day I was going to go do this and throw a, um, a flash behind it slightly because that pot is actually cracked to illuminate inside the pot, but it started pouring. And this year the trip was um, uh, canceled because of, uh, you know, the COVID stuff. So everybody says, yeah, we're going to go inside and eat dinner. I'm like, hey, man, I just didn't travel to the end of the earth, you know, to go eat dinner. I'll eat dinner later. I think that the sky is going to light up. And they were like, yeah, we don't know. Well, that's what happened. I mean, it just exploded with crazy color and it's saturated a little bit, you know, kind of a creative enhancement there, but, but it was, it was a spectacular, crazy sunset. So take what we got. So here's a nine bladed aperture. This is an 11 to 24 and we get the starburst, right? So normally with backlighting off snow like that, I'll stop down one stop. So normally I was telling you guys it's 1250 at F8. Well, something like this, I'm going to shut down one stop. You know, so I might be at 2,500 or 1250 F11, you know, whatever. But it's pretty darn close. And again, um, if you're not sure of the exposure, the fastest for way for you to determine the right exposure is just use Live View. Pop it in Live View with a live histogram. Then you can shut it off and you can take all the pictures you want. But I'm telling you guys, if you shoot it in manual, all of a sudden you'll become a better photographer. And once you understand how manual works, right, and how all this stuff locks together, meter patterns and all the other stuff, then you can gravitate to using automatic stuff but you'll understand why it's doing what it's doing and you'll understand when and how much to compensate. So yeah, if anybody who's married has seen this look in the morning, right? It's crazy. You know, it's just, this thing is fired up, you know, but I waited for all the other Cape Buffalo to go in the background. So I had kind of this monochromatic look to it. Right. And here's a point of interest as well. People will always tell you, focus on the eye. It's most critical. Well, if I shoot this guy at F8 and I focus on his eye, right? With a long telephoto lens, you have 50-50 with depth of field. 50 behind, 50 in front. So then I have behind his horns in focus and the tip of his nose out of focus. Well, that's not what I want. So my depth of field or my f-stop is the zone. But where I focus is going to take that zone and move it forward or back. So I hit him right smack in the bridge of the nose, like two inches in front of the eye, right? And that's why the tip of the nose is in focus to just at the edge of the horn. That's all the depth of field I needed but I certainly didn't want the nose out, right? So even if you push the depth of preview button and you do that, now a lot of mirrorless cameras will show you that in the viewfinder. Canon does not. Canon, you have to physically push the depth of preview button with a mirrorless camera to see. 24 millimeter lens, real close. But if I don't tilt the lens, you know, up or down a lot, and I get on the subject's level, there doesn't seem to be much distortion. So I love doing animal portraits. And typically, if I can get on their level, it's, it's much more, you know, um, intimate. So this is, this is 600 with a 2X at a 50th of a second in a blizzard. It'll never happen again. I've never seen it. All the times I've been to Yellowstone, I've never, ever seen it. And I asked the people who were with me, hey, you guys want to photograph that? They're like, nah, we're not going out there, man. It's minus 30 degrees, least deep snow. It's crazy. So I said, you guys mind if I shoot that? That's like a once in a lifetime. Nope. So I trudged like 100 yards. I was sweating like a dog. I mean, I got over there, peeled all my coats off, splayed the tripod, right tap on the snow, locked the mirror up, you know, and then I just went, <gasps> and right at the end of my breath, I just went pop, 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 pop. I did it a number of times. Then the snow started happening again. I walked back in the truck, and this is what I got. So it is tack sharp, and it's a once-in-a-lifetime crazy picture, but it screams Yellowstone and what they have to deal with. Getting down on the polar bear level, you know, from 50 feet away, that's a little exciting. It gives you a little adrenaline rush, but it's much more engaging than being uh, 14 feet up in a buggy doing it. So here's the same thing. I'm in a John boat running up and down a river, you know, so I'm actually sitting on the floor of the John boat. I'm not on the seat. I'm getting as low as I can, you know, and this guy is, uh, his name is Parker. 
And the reason they named him Parker is he's the big dominant bear, picks his spot, and he doesn't have to move. He just parks in that spot, and nobody messes with him. So hence Parker. But he's a, he's a pretty old dude, really, really big. But, but he's not, not aggressive for us. It's a snow macaque in Japan laying on my belly with a 400 DO lens, just trying to get on his level. I don't care if the background goes white, by the way. You get people, oh, you clip the background. So I'm going to underexpose the picture by a stop or two stops to get detail in the background. Then I have to go into post-production and open up his face. I'm not doing that. I'd rather let the background fall off a little bit, but make sure that my, my primary subject is integral as it can be. So same thing, you know, crazy bison up in, uh, in Norway. Laying on my belly, photographing a wild wolf. You know, he looks aggressive, but the truth of this is, it's pretty funny, he's got a cranberry stuck in his tooth or a crowberry. So he's kind of jostling his jaw around a little bit. But that's a one to 400 millimeter lens. So the group that I was with looking at me, and they're like, is this okay? And I go, I don't know, it doesn't seem aggressive at all. He's just eating berries. So I don't know why he must never have been hunted. He was up in the Arctic. So I lay down on my belly and then he starts to approach and everybody else said, I guess it's okay. So everybody laid down and we got these insane close-ups of wild wolves. So this is from my dentist, um, just a baboon screaming his brains out, but I definitely like the double eye contact. So here, you rarely see a bear's eyes lit up like that. Extremely rare. They're about the size of a human, right? First of all, mostly in, in Alaska, it's overcast. You know, so the eyes tend to be shaded a little bit by her forward brow and it's top lit. But the way the light was kind of reflecting off the water, illuminating the eyes, just was magic. You know, and he looks content and I look content. And I guess as long as we stayed that far apart and didn't get any closer, then, you know, we respected each other's boundaries. So 24 millimeter again. Crazy story. It's one of my favorite portraits. It's in Japan. So what I learned, this was the, the head snow macaque there, is when you're real close to these guys and you look at them, and you raise your eyebrows, it's antagonistic behavior. So that monkey just lurched forward, <laughs> right into my face, freaked me out of my mind. So there was a participant who didn't see that. So he says, hey, I gotta get a close up of that monkey. So I go, yeah, you should look right at him and raise your eyebrows. So he raises his eyebrows and I got this insane photograph of the monkey going, <laughs> and he's like, you dirty. <laughs> but it was pretty cool. So St. Augustine Alligator Farm, just kind of firing a little flash. So exposed to the background and just popping the strobe in a little bit, you know, right down the gullet. So all these animal portraits, right? I could shoot this guy at five, six when he's far away, but if he gets closer and I want to get more depth of field in there, I got to go to F11, right? So I'm constantly jostling the numbers back and forth. And if you're in manual, by the way, and let's say you're at 68 F8, well, if I take my index figure and I go three clicks to the right, I go from 60 to 125. But because I made a faster shutter speed, I need a smaller hole. So then I go three clicks to the other side. So as long as you're doing equal clicks in opposite directions, you maintain exactly the same exposure. Three up, three down, four up, four down, one up, one down, right? My friend Dave calls it a compensatory change. And that's what it is. So it's exactly the same exposure. Okay, this is in the Falklands. It looks like I shot in the studio. But again, it's a longer lens and that background is 300 yards away. So when the penguins are trumpeting, they stand up. They're above the other ones. So I'm just panning back and forth. And they usually do it multiple times. So when I saw one do it, bam, we're on them walruses right getting down on their level making sure that we don't spook them because there's thousands of there and you could start a stampede this guy was actually a little bit high on a hill you know so i kind of said well i don't want to shoot up on him so i walked up the hill a little bit to kind of narrow down that and what is he doing he's eating grass okay so let me do that so i right, waited for him to pick his head up we could see his eye composition works exposure's there then you get him eating in the galapagos it's godzilla he's real you could definitely tell you know, what they modeled them after. So again, getting low. You know, it's a big deal getting low on the subject's level. Fast shutter speeds, right? This was in June. So it's a red-winged blackbird collecting insects. It's with a new 1DX Mark III and a 600. It's the best focusing camera I've ever used in my life. It just fires and locks right on, you know, but, but you got to try and keep the, the bird in there. Now, lucky it was a little windy and they would hover, which gave me a second to lock on and rip off, you know, a burst of photographs. So fast shutter speeds, right? That bear is flying through that water. You know, same thing here. Look at it, four legs off the ground. So when they're fighting like this, same thing. You're already making a cognitive decision. I want to freeze motion. I need at least a 1600th of a second. I need at least five, six. So 1600 to five, six. Then what you're going to do is adjust your ISO to make sure that you have those parameters. And you'll hear people talk about auto ISO. Well, I use auto ISO. 
okay, it works great. But how is it basing the right compensation or right exposure based upon the tones and the pattern? So every time you move the camera left, right, up, down, zoom in, zoom out, change the tonal values in whatever pattern you're having, auto ISO won't work. If the tones are the same and the light just fluctuates, it does a perfect job. But if you're shooting things like this, where all of a sudden those two bands separate, and all of a sudden I got a lot more white behind there, bam, camera sees the white, gives you the wrong ISO, now you're back to playing photo roulette again. So here, so back in the good days, right, when photographers had to be photographers, and we physically had to move the focus point onto the subject, I couldn't do this with back button focus. And that's a whole nother bag. Back button focus is a gift from God. Anybody who doesn't use back button focus is not a professional. It's a lot of hogwash. And anybody who tells you that, go look for somebody else. The best method is the one that's ergonomically easier for you to utilize and the one that's easier for you to understand. For most people, it's easier to understand. If I push the button, the camera focuses. If I take my finger off, it doesn't focus. Simple, game over. But the reality is with back button focus, if I'm holding the focus button and that bear now runs to the left side, I have to take my finger off the focus button, go to the focus joystick or whatever it is, position the autofocus point again, and then go depress the autofocus button. Those fleeting moments, I lose the pictures over a lifetime. So if my finger's on the shutter button, right, that's going to keep the camera focusing. Then my thumb can position the autofocus point anywhere I want in the viewfinder. And I got the best of both worlds. So I will use back button focus if I'm shooting static subjects or I'm doing portraits where I got to do what's called FLR, focus, lock, and recompose. But when stuff is rocking back and forth like this, trust me, you can do it. You can do all the back button you want, but you're going to miss those fleeting moments because you have to physically take your finger off the back button, readjust focus points, and then reacquire. Now, that's no longer valid because we all have eye tracking. So now all I have to be concerned with is keeping the subject in the viewfinder. And the dang camera is going to keep the autofocus point on his eye, right? So it's a whole different ball of wax. So now if you want to use back button focus with, you know, autofocus and animal eye tracking, now you got a different game. But understand how it all works. Same thing here. I can't just hit that dude in the middle of his body. Because if he's at an angle, the head's a foot closer and the head's out of focus. So I physically have to move the focus points to maintain it on his face no matter where he moves. Fast shutter speeds, right? So when the bears miss, it's like a dog. It's a concentric circle. Starts at the tail, works its way up to the head, and I get this spin off of water. So it's really pretty cool. And I did it with fast shutter speeds, slow shutter speeds, all that kind of stuff, right? This guy's actually being towed by a jet ski. Nah, just kidding. But I always wanted to put a seagull on his back like Cowabunga. But, but it's a fast shutter speed. You know, can you imagine? Can you imagine getting like 800 pounds or 650 pounds out of the water? I could just about get myself out of the pool. I don't know how this guy does it. So transitions with autofocus. I set the tracking and the transition weight and weight. Normally when they splash, the cameras autofocus so fast, they'll go to the water drops. So I don't want to do that. So it's critical that we also understand how our cameras are set up and what's going to maximize the potential. Again, fast shutter speeds, right? Slow the tracking down. Okay, here, I'm at 32 hundredths of a second. These guys are flying in here really fast. This, this is in Costa Rica, right? So it's, it's the shutter speed that in this case was helping me freeze the subject. Whoops. So it was the shutter speed, and then it's just a, a little dribble of the flash kind of illuminating them a little bit. Typically with hummingbirds, it's going to be the other way. We're going to shoot the hummingbird in the shade, 250th of a second, and then we're going to let the strobes freeze the subject. So just a little bit different. But, but yeah, a swordbill hummingbird happens to be completely parallel to the, you know, the sensor, so the beak is almost tack sharp at the end. Not quite, but the picture is pretty cool. So fast shutter speeds. Fast shutter speeds. You know, same thing. Here's slow shutter speeds. So people will ask me, hey, how would you get the pelican to stay still? get the pelican to do anything i just photographed it when the pelican stays still but if you understand pelicans they do do that they hold these stoic poses for a couple of seconds right so i figured out what shutter speed i liked we got digital we could see it in real time so i photographed the 60 a 40th a 20th and i'm like oh 20th looks the best for me right so i shot this in live view so i could see exactly what the camera sees in real time but i shot it at a 20th of a second focus right on his eye and adjust the exposure so I happen to spot meter it, right? But you don't have to. If you're in live view and a live histogram, just going to make the exposure go to the right, but you're going to make sure it's not clipping the right highlights. And then when he holds perfectly still, take the picture. 
the cool advantage in live view is the mirror is locked up. So you negate the vibration. You can do it. Same thing, right? So now I got to wait for two of them. So it becomes even more critical. So a quarter of a second, right? Real early in the Falcons. The body's staying still, but the flippers are moving. So I like incorporating motion in the photographs when I can. Here's a wolf walking along the bank. You know, I was shooting something that was basically slower shutter speed and all of a sudden somebody yelled incoming. So this loon comes screaming in from the left and lands close to the boat. So you have to have your panning ability, you know, pretty much under wraps, right? The smoother I can pan with the subject, the sharper the bird's going to be at slower shutter speed. So again, this is a 20th of a second at Brooks Falls. So everybody's shooting the fast shutter speeds and all the other stuff. So I do plus two off the white water with a spot meter or I check it in live view, figured it all out, right? I'm watching the bear in live view. I tap on the back of the screen right on his face. And the only time I'm going to depress the shutter is when the bear looks like he's not moving. So I guarantee you, I fired off a hundred pictures and I might've got five that were tech sharp. Well, I don't really care about the other 95. All I care about is the five that I got. Those 95 are just a means to an end, but be goal oriented. Don't try and shoot everything. Pick one scenario, maximize the potential, and then move on to something else. Same thing here. So 14 trips to the Falklands. I'm getting tired of sharp penguins. What the heck could I do? So I'm shooting slow ones, and they're subjective. Some people like them, some people don't. Slow shutter speeds again. This is in Iceland. That piece of ice is about the size of a Volkswagen, right? But all of a sudden, we packed up, and the light pops next to the horizon. So I ran back down to the beach, popped my camera up, and all I did was go to F11, drop the shutter, the uh, ISO to 100 because I knew it would be a slow shutter speed, right? And I checked in live view on the histogram to make sure I didn't clip the ice highlights. And then I fired off the picture, and it's just serendipity. There's no way in the planet I could time that that wave is going to stop just before it hits that iceberg. It just can't, you know? So it's kind of like the blind squirrel thing. You shoot enough of them, and, uh, you know, once in a while we get a lucky one. Same thing here, right? So I picked a big iceberg so that when the waves are coming in, it wouldn't, really wouldn't rock. So the iceberg is rendered sharp and I get the water as a blur. How do we do this? The camera's not moving. I lock the camera physically down and do not move the camera, but I'm shooting it like a 15th of a second. So when the birds take off, I just fire the remote. So now whatever does move is rendered as a blur, but whatever's sharp is rendered sharp, right? So think it through. Figure out, again, tools and techniques that you want to utilize. So here, I love getting low. Right? I'm in Africa. I always pick the seat next to the driver. So I don't get as many photographs because a lot of those are hidden in the grass. But the ones I do get are pretty intense. I can guarantee when you're on that level of that eye and he looks right in your eyes, it's a different feeling. So imagine how the viewer feels. He's got that same feeling if you've done your job correctly. And it's the same thing here. When you're down low on that sub subject's level, you're in there. You don't see BBC shooting an Arctic fox from six feet up on the tripod. They want to immerse you in the Arctic Fox's world. So you got to get down lower. Same thing here. Get down low. Get on the subject's level. You know, as they get closer. This one was all rocks and stuff, so I couldn't get down as low as I wanted to. But again, get down low. Don't shoot it from standing positions. Here I'm in waders. I got the tripod like three or four inches above the water, you know. And then what would happen is the bear would slam the water, miss a fish, and then I had to pick the camera up for the wave. So I said, okay, I know I'm going to miss one and flood my camera. So I raised the camera up just a couple of inches. But you can see the difference when you're down on their subject's level. Same thing here, right? So I got the camera physically on the ground almost, shooting this bison walking right at us. You know, boom, right there. It's crazy when you're down on their level. Now, the longer the lens, I don't have to get down as low, right? Because we're negating the angle. So this is a 600. You know, and again, as soon as I see him starting to lift his head out of the water, that's when I'm locking focus and firing. So I got the crayfish right between his beak with the crazy meniscus. Fleeting moments, guys. It's just bang and it's over. You got it or you didn't. You know, I love the oval, the symmetry in this, you know, with the seal on Antarctica, the bear. So I crawled on my belly. This bear is like 40 feet away. He's, he was around us for a number of days. He wasn't threatening at all. Kind of uh, just casual bear. You know, so he said, yeah, okay, let's see what happened. So, so we kind of moved in there and the bear's complacent and I had moved just to the left and I got a perfect triangle. And then just as I'm about to shudder, he shifts his hips and I'm like, you dirty dog. So I got the, the one hip more on the right than the left. And then I said, okay, I got these and I did verticals. And it's just a, it's an unbelievable, it's one of my favorite photographs. So again, getting down on the subject's level, right? It's huge. I mean, it's a big, big difference in your imagery. Look at that. Even with the whales, 
You know, if you're sitting in those zodiacs and you're real low, sit on the bottom. Get down as low as you can. You know, this is an agami lizard in, in uh, Kenya. I'm laying on my belly right in the middle of the, you know, the walkway where everybody's going to dinner. Looks like a Revlon ad. Same thing, right? Lake Clark. I mean, it's just cool when you're down there. Now, sometimes you got to get up a little higher. So I didn't want that horizon line going through the center of the bear, right? So, you know, it's guidelines, right? Nothing's fixed in stone. Same thing here. So this is a 24 millimeter lens. I'm holding my hand all the way out and I'm in live view, right? So try not to disturb the, the penguin, right? Getting down on their level. So two to 400, laying in the grass. Eagle on the boat, you know? So when we wanted to do portraits, I got down and low in the boat as possible in Japan, and that's where we're shooting, on their level. So again, it engages the viewer a lot more, you know? I'm not shooting all the eagles that are up high in the tree. You know, I'm waiting to come across an eagle that's lower, so it's a much more intimate picture. I don't need the eagle booty. Pileated. I set a 12-foot deer stand up in the tree to photograph. All right, so I'm not laying down on my belly. I'm photographing uh, the pileated up in the tree. Okay, if we're shooting white on white again, right? Remember I said, come back with a story. What do you want to photograph? So for me, I want as cold as possible in Yellowstone. I want to show that hardship that a lot of people aren't willing to see themselves, you know, or don't want to, you know, get out there and endure that. But I want to show it. So I'm going in those crazy conditions, but I make sure that I'm doing horizontal, verticals, close up, full lengths, you know, all that kind of stuff. Same thing here, right? White on white, you know, but that's what we're looking for. Graphic. I love shooting in the snow. It's just graphic. And if you expose to the right and you push those highlights, but don't clip them, it makes your shadows brighter. So then in post, all you have to do is pull the detail back for the highlights. And that's a whole nother, you know, um, seminar, but, but you can get the detail on all of it. Same here. People see this and they freak out. Oh my God, white on white. It's so hard. It's not that hard. You just got to put that, you know, um, tonal value where it's supposed to be on the Instagram. Look at this. Crazy, just subtle lighting, but you see every speck of detail in the picture. You know, black wolf, right? So I expose for the highlights and the wolf looks pretty good. Screaming crazy moose, minus 50 degrees in the Arctic. It was nuts. It was unbelievably cold. And, you know, after the rut, sometimes the, the bulls will herd up together like this. Fox. Now, what I do do on these images, I just put detail in the foreground. I don't put detail in the background. So it's there. I know it's there because I didn't clip the RGB values. But I want the foreground, middle ground, background, right? So it gives a sense of 3D, the subtle shadows in the foreground, and you can see the detail. But I don't put that, I don't brush it into the background because I want your eye to stop on the fox. Then I have three distinct zones, foreground, middle ground, background. Your eye stops on the fox and it works, right? Put them in the foreground. Same thing, you know, so we're photographing the high key stuff. This is a once in a lifetime shot again. You know, it's a polar bear who, um, grabbing a caribou out of the ice. Bobcat, camouflage, but you can see the detail on all the snow. There's nothing that's clipped, you know, and that's what we're trying to do. And your composition is going to tie it all together. This is the silliest looking coyote I've ever seen in my life. It looks like Wiley Coyote. Got a crossed eye, a bent ear. It was like absolutely hysterical watching him. Now you can see the striations in the snow, right? So I didn't want to pull that out too much because he was dragging that swan carcass across the road. So I'm not fond of, you know, trying to show those striations in the pictures. Everybody tells you polar bears are carnivorous. Well, except for Blue Moon here. So Blue Moon was sitting in the crowberry patch. They got a henna tattoo on his bum. And then he had purple paws and blue paws. So wherever he touched his head, he got a paw print on his coconut. So it was really cool. But they're, they're, they're you know, omnivores as well. They're not just 100% carnivore and they're not just all going to eat you, you know, like sharks and, you know, all that kind of myths. People say, well, how'd you get the tree to emulate the bear? I didn't do that. I didn't even see that, to be honest with you, when I shot the picture. I knew the bear was going to stand there because it's a tree that they frequently sent mark. So when I saw the bear coming into the field, I told everybody, hey, come over here. More than likely, the bear is going to stand over there. Go vertical, set the exposure in the camera and be ready for it. You know, and that's, again, where understanding animal behavior, you can predict what's going to happen, set up for it, and you're going to get much more successful imagery. This is in the Falcons. It's, I've only seen it twice. I thought the penguin got bit by a sea lion, but it didn't. It's a courtship battle. So the penguin pecks the other one on the flippers. The capillaries are close to the, the skin, you know, to keep them warm. And when they whack each other with their flippers, the blood splatters all over the place. It's a kind of a crazy picture. Photographing the snowy owls again. Can't see the snowy owl at all. He's just not there. So my friend James and I are out there walking in the winter, freezing. All the seagulls take off. And lo and behold, guess who's in the middle? He's just sitting there. 
right? I'm laying under the fence so that I don't have the, you know, homes in the background and trees in the background. So you have to watch everything. You're responsible for everything in the viewfinder. You know, it's not a bunch of excuses. Oh, by the way, I didn't see this. I didn't see that. I'm going to take this in or take it out. Look around. You know, we go to a waterfall, people jump out of the car, right? And they just start shooting pictures. I go, you know, that waterfall has been there for millions of years, right? Pretty sure it's not going to change in the next hour. So take your camera off the tripod, walk around, look left, look right, zoom in, zoom out, find the spot you want. And once you find that spot, set the tripod up to that spot. I love this picture. It's like, uh, you know, I caught him in the act. It's like, hey, can we have a little privacy here? So anyways, minus 50 degrees. It's freaking freezing out. But I would go back and do it in a heartbeat. Look at the side lighting, right? It's just dramatic. You know, it's the craziest winds coming over our shoulder we've had in the Falklands. Otters, right? I know I'm running on here. It's 9 o'clock already. So this is my happy feet, right? It's in the Falklands. I got that. Um, I got higher because I didn't want that horizon line going through the center of the penguins. This is a wider angle. It's like uh, 24 to 70. I crawled up on, uh, on the bird, and it was the first wraparound cover ever for Birding Magazine. This is a setup shot. It's not real. Um, we brought the mountain lion up there to do a shoot, um, but still pretty cool, right? So we're, we're watching the side lighting and all the other stuff. You know, shorter lens, 70 to 200. It's the different perspective, you know? So the subject doesn't have to be big in the frame to make the photograph work. Right? It just has to be in the right spot compositionally. So we got the small fox, his den is in that little crevice, and the picture works. Same thing here. So how many whale tails and close-ups can you photograph? So let's set the story. Let's give a sense of context. You know, same thing here. This is in Antarctica with a leopard seal, right? The coyote. So I had my 600 with me. I could have shot a close-up of him, but that doesn't tell you anything. Right? So here I have the river, I got the coyote, I got the furthest foot forward, sense of motion, all that stuff, and it ties the whole thing together. Same thing here. Don't cut the, the piece of ice. Keep the viewer's eye in the frame as long as you can. I don't know where those penguins are going, but they're happy going there. You know, and I like the composition and the triangles and all that stuff. Maybe higher is better. You know, location, location. I don't know, the penthouse view. Nothing up there except snow, right? Small bear, bigger picture. But look how many triangles are in the photograph. It's the composition that makes it work. Same thing here, right? That tree gives a sense of context. Right? He's standing. Now there's another bear behind him. Right? So I had to wait for that other bear to go behind him so you really couldn't see him. Otherwise, I got like a leg sticking out of there. The picture is not going to work as much. And that was really cold and windy. Right? So this is a 24 millimeter. But again, it's, it's got so much depth perception because of that. So I want that horizon and I want that little bit of sky back there. If I cut that off, it's a completely different photograph. Right? We're in the Falcons. I'm concentrating on groups of penguins. I already got a lot of close-ups. Okay, what do I want to do for the next couple of days? All right, concentrate on groups. And that's exactly what I did. Right? So we got rock hoppers, Magellanics, Gen 2s, king penguins, and we're concentrating on the groups. You know? So you look at this picture, and there's a sense of dynamic balance. The picture doesn't look like it's going to tip over left or right. right? So even though that one penguin is off to the left, it, it doesn't feel that way. And there's equal distance between the the penguin on the left and the, and the border as there is on the right and the border, right? So the only thing I did in this picture was darken the sky just a touch. But here, the only time I shoot these type of animalscape images is when the sky is conducive to doing so. I'm not going to do this if it's a complete blue sky. I'll shoot, you know, other, other types of pictures. Or if it's completely overcast, I might just shoot headshots, right? So pick the conditions and make it work for you. Same thing here. So when I got the clouds in the sky, that's, you know, adds drama. You can't do this picture with film. You guys remember film, right? It's a four-letter word. They used to use it back in the old days. Anyway, so, so they got this stuff called film. But with digital now, this is actually six different pictures. It's three horizontals on top of each other, one for the shadows, one for the highlights. So I put the three highlights together, the three shadows together, and then I can blend them in post-production. But you can't do that. You can't get that same depth perception, you know, back then with film. Plus, the thing is like six feet long and a zillion megapixels, you know, so it's an unbelievable uh, photograph. It's uh, Yosemite. So the end of this, there's only like three more images. It's please be aware of the animals and put the animal welfare first, right? So Big Cat Diaries and these other guys in Africa, those cheetahs are trained to jump on something high. They could sit there and they could survey the savanna. But they also have Pavlov. 
So they know when all these truck stops, they gravitate to the trucks, right? Ooh, what do they have? So we just saw this little guy drop, you know, the baby. And I'm like, look, we're here for literally two minutes. I see anything coming this way, we're out of here. And that's what we did. We ripped off a bunch of pictures and then we moved on. You know, it's hard enough for these things to survive. I don't want to be the cause of it, you know, and please put them first. So we got a crazed elk. This is the Canadian Rockies. I mean, Edward Scissorhead, he is completely fired up out of his mind, right? So I told everybody, look, you got to be really careful of this guy. He's got his little harem over here. Do not go near the harem. Nobody's allowed 10 feet off the bumper of the truck, right? So we're first ones there. So a car would pull in and they'd say, hey man, just be careful. Don't pull next to the, you know, next to the cows, the ladies. All right, whatever. So I said it to somebody else and they were like, well, who are you? I go, hey, I'm nobody. I'm just telling you, it's not a good idea to do that because you're going to get holes in the side of your vehicle. So every time that spot would be open, somebody would pull over there with a car. So I said, okay, I guess we're taking the big lenses off, put the 70 to 200s on and let the games begin. <laughs> so we got all these pictures of these cars getting smashed. Now the downside to that is because of human stupidity, they catch the guy and they cut his horns off. So now he's not breathing that year. So be aware, you know, of what goes on. One last story. So we're in, we're in Africa, there's three lion cubs, right? And there's all these vehicles and everybody's photographing them and stuff like that. And then the cubs get up and they're going to move off with mom. And all these trucks are fighting for position to try and get pictures of the cubs. They're blocking its path, they're cutting it off, and I'm getting extremely upset by it, right? Now there's two males from the Goro Goro Crater who are up there trying to take over the pride. And what are they going to do? They're going to kill those cubs, right? So we got all these trucks there and I told my driver, I had three trucks with me, just call the other drivers. We're leaving now. I am not being a part of this. We're out of here. And they were like, what? So I'm like, call them right now. So we called them on the phone, you know, on the, on the radios. I explained to the group, hey, I'm not doing it. It's not conducive to the welfare of the animals. And we leave. Well, guess what they did? 15 minutes later, they drove them right to where the lions were. And they killed the cubs right in front of everybody. So I was fuming. I was extremely upset. And the guide said, all the time this lodge has been here, you are the only one who has ever practiced what he preached. Everybody else comes here and says, look, the welfare of the subject is priority. But when it comes to getting the pictures, all that stuff goes out the window. So I'm asking you, please, as a steward for the wildlife, do the right thing. Don't cut branches in front of nests, right? Don't put the picture above the welfare of the animal. And then this is the last picture. So it's not all hard life. I'm laying there taking a siesta and that little white dot straight over me all in the background is a polar bear. So I got somebody else keeping an eye on that bugger as we're running around. So I know I talked your ear off, um, but as you can tell, I'm passionate about this stuff. I absolutely love it. And all I want to do is help everybody else take better photographs. So, so thank you very much from my heart. Appreciate it. Mr. Glazer, Glatzer, excuse me. If you could just, you said yep. only one more story. I yeah, think we could listen to the 100 more. You're wonderful. You know, apparently Ken Burns reports that that Ansel Adams at one point was showing pictures to people early in his career. And, and, the, and the advice was just show them the ones where they say, wow, well, you, 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 just, you just packed something like I don't know how many days worth of stuff into this short time. Thank you so much. Uh, thank stay you. Well. Thank you. Stay well. Thank, yes. thank, thank you. you very, very much. It was fabulous. It's wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, you thank guys you are welcome. Thank you. So, thank you. Great job. Thank you. Do we have time for any questions if thank people you. got them? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah please. I, I have one. Uh, if you're, if you're um, setting an exposure for a particular animal at a particular time, like a bear, and all of a sudden, something white comes in. Okay, you've already set that. What do you do? Shut down three clicks. So I just take my index finger and go three clicks to the right. Shut down one full stop. Okay. Right? So it depends. If it's overcast, I don't have to shut down much at all. But if it's bright, sunny conditions and high contrast, you know, so you're pushing the edges of the dynamic range. You know? But yeah, if I'm in manual, it's easy, man. I'm in control of the whole thing. I want to make it darker, I make it darker. I want to make it lighter, I make it lighter. Right, again, the problem with that automatic stuff is it's going to be based upon the tonal values in the pattern. And every time you change the percentage of values in the pattern, it gives you a different recommendation. You're going to apply compensation to get back to what you just had five minutes ago. Okay, thank could, you. Could I ask a question? I wanted to ask um, if you could explain a little more 
you were saying that often you would ex expose in a snow scene, you would expose so that the white, in other words, you would focus on the snow in terms of exposure to not clip it. But if, you're, if you've got a really dark animal, doesn't that um, make the animal darker than if you blew out the snow a little bit? How do you get the animal? No, to it's going to make it lighter. So, so if, I, if I make the detail, like, so let's say well, you have to make a decision, right? So if you have a bird in the sky and the sun's straight up, you have a decision to make. Either you expose for the bird and the sky blows out, or you expose for the sky and you get a silhouette, right? So my, my course of action is don't photograph that. Shoot it when the sun's lower on the horizon and the bird's fully illuminated, right? So I'm not going to shoot stuff that I know is not going to be conducive for me. So you're making decisions all the time. But like when we do the metering class, I have a bison in the snow. And the bison is 25% of the viewfinder walking in a blizzard, right? And the picture looks perfect. Then the bison stops, starts to eat grass, and I zoom in with a 600. My exposure is exactly the same. Nothing has changed. The bison looks exactly the same whether I zoom in or out. But if you zoom in with your camera, it sees the dark, says, I'm going to make it light. Now you got to put compensation to make it look like you did in the first picture. What am I doing? No, so I, I, know, I know you, sh so I, know I, you I don't want the highlights clipped. If you say you don't care about the highlights, fine. But with the newer cameras and dynamic ranges and all the other stuff, the picture on a low contrast day with snow scenes and a dark bison and snow is not that far apart. It's all within the capture media, right? It's within six or seven stops. So the other thing for me is it's, it's nonsense when you hear people go, my camera can record 14 stops of dynamic range. Yeah, in theory, but not by the time it's going to come out of the back of your camera. If you shoot a mid-tone and you go one stop brighter, two stops brighter, three stops brighter, and then you do the same thing for the shadows, the pictures are going to clip within seven stops. You blew all the highlights in the shadows. So if you take that picture and then you open up the shadows three stops and go, look, I still got detail, I don't care. I'm not opening my shadows three stops. That just means you don't know what you're doing in shooting pictures. If you shoot landscapes like that, it's not what you're supposed to be doing. You're supposed to be shooting multiple pictures to increase the dynamic range and understanding how to make the most of it in post-production. But you don't want to take stuff that's two stops darker and make it lighter. It's going to bust apart, right? So I'm pushing the subjects to the, the snow to the right, right? Maybe, I don't know, less than an eighth of an inch off the right side. So I know I have as much detail as I can. And because I'm making the snow brighter, if you look at the back of the camera, it doesn't look like you see a lot of detail in the snow. But because I'm making it brighter, I'm making the darks brighter. So I might have to just maybe make the shadows a little bit brighter, but not as much as if I did it the other way. Okay, thank you. Yeah, if you're shooting high key and you don't care about the background, then yeah, blow it out. You're so, yeah. pretty much dead on in almost everything you did, but I'm assuming that you're still shooting raw to give you a little wiggle room. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'm shooting 100% raw. The only time I shoot with a JPEG is if there's um, like a magazine or something like that that has a quick deadline, and I got to send them the pictures real fast, you know, but I still have the raw file, right? So I'll send it to them just for contact sheets or stuff like that. But yeah, I want that raw file. So when they call up and say, hey, we want a poster or we want a frame or, you know, well, you know, or like the new R5s that came out, you know, that uh, didn't have the, the raw converters yet. So I shot JPEG and raw, you know, and then Adobe came out with the DNG converter. So we did that for a while. And by the way, here's the new puppy. So the Ooh. R5 and the one, the 500. <laughs> drool, drool. <Yeah. laughs> yeah. What, what question, percentage of um, pictures do you shoot uh, in burst versus one-offs? The only time I do a burst if there's a lot of action. Otherwise, I'm just squeezing off one. Tchung, tchung, tchung. Yeah. Now, the slower the shutter speed, the more I'm going to burst, right? Because invariably, when you rip off those slower shutter speeds, there's like a sine wave <laughs> through the lens. You know, it was worse with DSLRs because you had mirror bounds, right? So there's a couple of pictures where it's going to equal out real good with the IS. You know, otherwise, it's not. So you fire off 10 pictures, you get two to detect sharp. The other eight are like somewhat soft. So the slower the shutter speeds, it is, it is kind of advantageous to rip off a little bit of a burst. Now with the mirrorless cameras, you can go to silent or electronic shutter, and I can physically handhold this new lens. It's got six stops IS with the lens and the camera together. Six stops. So I was handholding it at like a 40th of a second. I can consistently get sharp pictures at 500 millimeters. Now, of course, what I'm shooting is not dead, so it's not applicable for everything. But, I mean, to even have that ability. So you got the crazy IS, you got what you see through the viewfinder in real time. 
it's you know i focus tracking it's a whole nother world I, the same same to what what percent of your shots are shot on a tripod versus handheld okay most of it now for wildlife is shot off a tripod so what ends up happening is the tripod becomes more debilitating than an asset yeah. if i've got a big lens like a 600 and i'm locked on a tripod by the time i raise or lower that and spin left to right sometimes i'm missing the action so there's a lot to be said if you can hand hold that camera right Whatever you have, if you can successfully handhold it and you have a fast enough shutter speed, why do I need the tripod? It becomes a detriment. You guys follow me? Yes. I mean, to move up and down, left and right, it, it becomes too cumbersome. I miss pictures. And a lot of what we do is just little fleeting moments, you know? But if I'm shooting things like, you know, in Bosky and I'm in one spot consistently and I'm photographing snow geese for an hour, yeah, I'm on a tripod. You know, I, I can't handhold that 600 for, you know, for that long. Yes, Charles, sir. could I ask Thank you a question? You. Yeah. Yeah. So when when you talk about midtones, what what do you re what color is it? The blue, Not the a color. green. It, okay. Make the color out of it. Make the whole thing black and white. So when you say red, you can have light red, dark red, right? So, so it can be various tones. In the scene where you had, let's say, the turkey early on, where there were no highlights, where are you putting yep. the histogram in that situation? So the grass is basically about a midtone, depending upon your camera. So there was a time where Nikon and Canon saw that differently. One was 12%, you know, Nikon was two thirds of a stop darker on all those midtone shots. So that became a problem when we used to shoot black bears. So I'd shoot them at 125th and the guys with Nikons had to shoot them at a 90th of a second. And you're like, uh oh, so they got less sharp pictures because of that. But now it's all even, so that's not an issue anymore. But for your particular camera, just figure it out, right? So the easiest thing for me to do, what does a spot meter do? The spot meter does one thing. It takes whatever's in the pattern and makes it a midtone. It doesn't tell you it's a midtone. It makes it a midtone. So if I point that spot meter, let's say you're an aperture priority with no compensation, at a white piece of paper, a black piece of paper, and a gray piece of paper, they all come out exactly the same. So you have to say, well, how much brighter is a white piece of paper? Well, if I go plus one, it's light gray. If I go plus two, it's white with detail. If I go three stops above, it's pure white. And conversely, the same thing on the other end of the scale. So if I go minus one, it's dark gray, minus two is black with detail, minus three is pure black. So all I have to do is look at something, point the spot meter at it, the center of the viewfinder, and say how much brighter or darker is it than a midtone? Now I don't have to worry about the background anymore, which is the main problem with the value of a matrix metering. It takes into account the whole screen. So that's the biggest issue for me. It's like, I don't wanna have to second guess. And then you take exactly the same scene, right? And you're in a value of RGB metering and you point it at the same subject in low contrast or high contrast and you get two different recommendations. So the cameras are designed to automatically give you different algorithms to render the picture basically as you see it, but they are biased towards a mid-tone value. Now that said, the newer cameras take more into account the focus point. So, so they are getting more precise, you know, but again, I don't want to have to second guess all this stuff. So I don't care if the bear is looking the completely opposite direction. I'm going to point the camera at the bear. I'm going to pop the thing in live view or whatever I need to do and fire off a picture or look at it. And I'm going to adjust it so it's perfect. Now when the bear does do what I want, bam, in the bag, right? But what I don't want to do is every time I zoom in or out, go horizontal or vertical, have to change the exposure because I can't concentrate on taking pictures. I'm concentrating on changing the damn exposure all the time. Okay. So it becomes a nightmare. So let's say for argument's sake that there's a white wolf. Yeah. Now, the, the real pro cameras, okay, the, the D5 and the one DX Mark III, you can assign the focus point to the spot meter or the spot meter to the focus point. So how much brighter is the white wolf than gray? Two stops. So I go aperture priority, spot meter plus two stops, and I keep it on the white wolf. Now, wherever that white wolf runs from shade to sunlight, it's perfectly exposed. If I do that in a valuative metering, now it takes into account the background. Game over. Doom. So that's why I'm adamant about telling people, you have to understand how the metering patterns work and then tie it in with the modes, whether that's manual mode, shutter priority, aperture priority. We're, we're, we, we do what's called a, a tech series. It's four days. It's one full day of understanding metering. So we have classroom, then we take it into the field and practice what we preach. The next day is flash, right? So it's basically on camera, off camera, manual, TTL, all that nonsense. And then we have the third day is um, visual skills. What makes a good picture? What doesn't make a good picture? And the fourth is post-production. But, but here's what ends up happening. So I'm in a room. There's a divider. 
there's my class and another guy's class and he's teaching waterfall. And he says, Hey, stop for a minute. Listen to what that guy's saying. He's telling you to shoot the waterfalls in manual exposure. So he goes, everybody knows that it's more important to shoot waterfalls at slow shutter speeds. So you should be in shutter priority. Now, ideally the end result's going to be the same exposure regardless of how you derive it, right? It's going to be the same exposure. But here's the difference. If he shoots it in shutter priority and the waterfall takes up 25% of the viewfinder and the camera sees a lot of dark and he's in evaluative metering, he's got to put compensation to get the picture correct, right? Camera seeing dark, you got a white water. So you got to make the picture darker. The waterfall is perfectly exposed. Now change the composition. Now he's back to doo -doo 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 -doo, playing photo roulette because he changed the tonal values in the evaluative pattern. Now he's got to dial in compensation to get back to the same exposure. If you do it in manual and you lock that in the camera, I could zoom in out, horizontal, vertical, as long as my subject and priority is the water, I don't change the damn thing. So it's just a different method to the madness. Your exposure is one and the same. But once I already did the hard work and I got it, why do I want it to deviate? So if the lighting is fixed, I don't need all the automatic stuff. You know, if I want to do Hail Marys where I'm not really sure exactly what's happening, yeah, I'll put it in aperture priority, but I might define the pattern to spot meter where I might, you know, pick a value of metering. So again, it's really important for you guys to understand how the patterns work and then how they go together with the, with the priorities. The meter patterns determine exposure, the priority modes just change the variable. So let's do this for just a moment. You're gonna make a cognitive decision. You're an aperture priority, F8 is what's most important. You're gonna put F8 in the camera, the camera's gonna pick the shutter speed based upon the tonal values in whatever pattern you use, right? Boom, you're in manual mode. So manually, I put F8 in the camera. The only difference is physically, I'm going to change the shutter speed to get the right exposure. That's the only difference. Either the camera's changing it or I'm changing it. Yeah, down. But the biggest difference is when I move the camera now, it's not going to deviate. If you're in automatic mode, you move the camera. Here we go again. So on that score, my question is, if I'm tracking, a, if I'm panning and tracking a bird in flight, I'll generally shoot in manual mode, but with auto ISO because it, the background can change. And so, so do you want exposed to the background? Or you want exposed to the bird? I want exposed to the bird. <laughs> right. Then don't put it in auto ISO. Cause auto ISO is going to change depending upon the meter pattern. If you have a value of metering, auto ISO is going to change based upon the value of meter pattern, which is the background. So if the background gets lighter or darker, your auto ISO is going to fluctuate up and down. And you're going to put compensation to get back to what you already knew was the right exposure. The first time and I went to Bosky, first time I went to Bosky, right? There's a guy next to me with his group and he's kind of barking at everybody. The bird's in the sky. Okay. It's plus one. The bird's in front of the dark tree. It's minus one. It's in the cornfield. It's plus two. I'm telling everybody it's 2,500 at F8. Don't change anything. They're like, why? I go, it's the same bird in the same light. I don't care if it's a hundred yards away or two feet in front of me. Same bird, same light. The only thing that's changing is the background. So if my priority is the subject, don't change anything. And then all of a sudden, right, because I've been at this 38 years, all of a sudden everybody's saying, if you shoot birds in flight, don't do that. Shoot manual exposure. And I know why it started to happen. <laughs> <laughs> so it's that and, and, and myself and a partner opened the first nature magazine online. So you get this big dissemination of information. And all of a sudden everybody goes, you know, that makes sense. So the other group is standing there looking at their pictures going, this one's light, this one's dark, this one's this. So I got eight people in my group, they're going, you know, every one of these exposures is the same and they're perfect. I go, really? I wonder how that happened. So you don't shoot in, uh, in uh, auto exposure, you shoot in a uh, manual. Not a lot. Yeah, not a lot. I do when I know it's gonna work. Overcast conditions where the tonal values are all the same, all that automatic works perfectly. But okay. when you have a small subject and a, you know, and a, and a different size background and they're different tones, no, nah, hell no. It's not going to work. Okay. It's not going to work. So you know it, right? You could tell me right there, you know, the gentleman who just said that, that I guarantee if you're doing that auto ISO and you're tracking that bird in the sky and the background changes, you got 15 different exposures. Yep. That's how it works. It's based upon the meter pattern. So I don't care about the background. I'm not putting it, letting it influence my pictures. The fallacy for most and, people is they look at the camera and they go, well, zero, that's the right exposure. It's not the right exposure at all. If everything's perfect and it's all even tones, it'll be perfect. Otherwise, all it is is a recommendation based upon the tonal values and the pattern. 
and the algorithms that the manufacturer decided, you know, we think we should put in there. So um, if you're in spot I, meter, I, zero does one thing. It always makes it a midtone. If you're in a value meter, zero's always question. changing. Zero's never that, the same. My, Every picture you take in a value of metering, zero is a different starting point because it's based upon the tones and the pattern. So how do you, how do you get something that's consistent? I don't even know where it's going to start. So how do I do it? So I'm always behind the eight ball. I always got to fire off three pictures. Look at it. Shit, this one's light. That one's dark. Da -da -da. I adjust it. Perfect. Now I move and I change the tones. Uh-oh. Here we go again. <laughs> do, do you like spot metering any better? When yeah, linked spot to meter, the focus plug? spot meter all the time. Yep. I use spot metering most of the time, except when, when I'm doing mirrorless, you know, where I got live view because I'm looking through the viewfinder in real time. So that's kind of another thing. People will ask, so what pattern do you use with a mirrorless camera? It's irrelevant. It doesn't make a bit of difference if you're looking through the viewfinder. Basically, what you see is what you get. So I don't care what it is. And then I bring up the small histogram in the viewfinder, and all I'm watching is the edges, right? So I don't care what the middle of the histogram says. I'm just watching the right side for highlights. And if I'm photographing black bears, I'm watching the left side making sure I don't push the black bear up against the left side. Then to answer the other gentleman's question, I don't have any detail in the shadows. That's a lot of information. You make it sound very easy. <laughs> very easy. Everybody yeah. makes it harder. The more, the more automatics you put in the camera, the harder it becomes for you. Because you have to second guess everything that's doing, you know, that's going on. Every time that becomes like, you can't concentrate on the task at hand. You're driving yourself nuts. Everybody makes it far more difficult than it has to be. So invite me back down the road and I'll do that whole metering class for you. You're on. Oh, you're on. Guarantee you'll change on. everything that you do. Search, Find get up. great. Good idea. You don't know what you've asked or you said. <laughs> He's going to talk about all this metering stuff and anything else he wants to talk about is fine too. Yeah. <laughs> as long okay. as we get to see more photos. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Right. But, but again, guys, I mean, it, it's truly a pleasure for me to do this. I, the best thing that could ever happen for me is, you know, somebody's little light bulb goes off, you know, and the gentleman just asks about the auto ISO, shuts it off and says, hey, you know, all my pictures are now consistent. Mm. I mean, that's, that's the best thing for me. You know, when we go Challenge out there and I have a group. Yeah, when we go out there and I have a group with me, it's not about me. I know I could take a good picture. You know, it's about seeing that guy next to me take a photograph and win BBC or the grand prize for nature's best or, you know, however many zillions of awards people have won. You know, that's the cool thing. That's the accolade. You know, and as a teacher, that means I did the right thing, right? That's what it's about. I don't care. I have a question me. for you. Yeah. Um, when you have the exposure kind of locked in, that's fine when you're in, uh, uh, in unchanging lighting conditions. But if you've got a cloudy sky where it's changing, what do you do? Do you ride the uh, exposure compensation dial to adjust for that? No, if I'm in manual, there's no such thing as using the compensation. That's a really bad habit. So don't use the compensation. Just either change your shutter speed or your f-stop. It's much easier. Just make the picture lighter or darker. Don't use the compensation because what is it going to be doing? Is the compensation going to be changing your ISO, your f-stop, your shutter speed? I don't know, but I want to be in control of that parameter, right? I could shoot a picture at 1600 at 5.6 or 3200 at f4. The exposure is exactly the same, but the outcome of the picture is completely different. One has a lot of depth of field with no shutter speed. The other has no depth of field with a fast shutter speed. So it's not just I got the exposure, right? It's which port set of numbers is going to give you the picture the way you want. So why do I want the camera to pick that? I don't. So to answer your question is, if, if I look at the subject and the subject looks better when the cloud comes over, I'm going to wait for the cloud to come back. I'm not going to fight the whole thing and shoot both of them. I'm just not. The other thing is take both. So we're in the alligator farm, right? And there's an alligator in the sun, and then there's the shady spot. So I figure out, I already know what the exposure in the sunlight is. So then I meter the one sitting in the shade, but he's not doing anything. So I make a mental note. Okay, it's a stop and a half dark, you know, darker in the shade. So a stop and a half, it's five clicks. Stop and two there, okay. So if something happens, I go five clicks to the left and I shoot him. I already did the hard work. I already figured it out. I don't want the guessing. I don't want to be close enough. I want to be able to nail it. So there was, a, there was a guy on a website, and he's like, you're going to tell me your method is better than me putting the camera in aperture priority and trying to shoot this bird flying through dappled light in the forest, changing the compensation. So I said, no, your method is better. So he goes, I knew it. 
He goes, why? I said, because I'm not shooting that crap. I'm going to go have lunch. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to shoot a dappled bird flying through the forest. Which one is going to, it's going to, all I'm going to suck. <laughs> so, so the more you understand, the more you understand what makes a good picture, concentrate on that. Don't shoot everything. Oh, gosh. You know, if you're shooting something this way because you have your window of opportunity, it's best right there, then don't shoot the bird over here. It's not going to look good. You got a bird flying in the sky with the sun above you? It's going to, half the bird's going to be lit, overexposed, half's going to be dark. Look for something that works. We'll wait for the bird to just bank like this. Now it's evenly lit from stem to stern. Now I can take the bird. But don't shoot that. Half is lit, half is dark. It's not going to work. Look for things that are good. You know, that's why it's important for you guys. Look, what you're doing with the clubs is an excellent idea. But, but don't dismiss looking at 500px or 1x or, or Instagram, you know, for what everybody's doing. And just look at that stuff. And, you know, and you kind of get an idea. You, you know, you can make like a clip file. You go, oh, look at these, you know. I like this one, this one, this one, this one. Why? And after a while, you'll pick a common denominator. and You start to realize what you like. Not necessarily what somebody else's likes. So when I do the tech series, okay, we put a, I put a blank piece of paper and one crayon on your desk. And I go, draw me a rainbow. So the first day, everybody looks at me like a deer in the head. It's like, I'm going to draw a rainbow. I got one crayon. So the end of the first day, you got spot metering, evaluative metering, right? Reference value, sunny 16, a handheld meter. Now you got eight crayons. The next day, you got eight more, blah, blah, blah. By the end of the class, you got 48 crayons. Draw me a rainbow now. So what I'm trying to do is give everybody the fundamentals to draw the pictures that you see. I appreciate that people like my photographs and they want to emulate those, but that's not my goal. My goal is for you to see the picture and be able to pick the crayons to draw the one that you like. But that means that you have to understand the rationale behind the way that the camera works. There's far too many people who can take really good pictures, but they can't teach because they go, okay, it's too light, make it dark. It's too dark, make it light. Thank you for nothing. If you don't understand why it's doing that, then how do you correct for it? Right? So you can't. You got to build the base of the pyramid. You got to understand the patterns and, and how the priority modes work. And then if you understand how they tie together, now you can pick the best method for the madness. It's just like autofocus. That's the biggest thing as well. It's, it's understanding metering. And then it's how to use autofocus effectively. That drives people off the deep end. So that's a whole nother, you know, that's a whole nother class. There is two of them. Yeah. I know. <laughs> I'll tell you, that's... So again, you, you don't use um, back button focus much, do you? I don't use back button focus for things that are moving. I will use back really? button focus for, for landscapes or portraits or things that are static and stuff like that. But now you got the eye tracking nonsense. So you could use back button focus to your heart's content. It's not going to matter. Just push it in, it focuses, take your finger off, it stops. You don't have to be concerned anymore with shifting the focus points. That's the reason I didn't use back button focus. Because you have to take your finger off the button. You guys follow me with that? So here, if you're going to back button focus, you got to push this in, right? Now yeah. you got to take your finger off, move the focus point around, and then go back to acquiring focus. Well, that time lapse, I lose the fleeting moments. I could lose the best pictures of my life. So if my finger's on the shutter focusing, now I could physically move these in real time and keep firing pictures. Right. But now like with the one DX, there's a little sensor so you can use back button and still move your finger around. So that kind of helps. But with the newer cameras and the eye tracking, you could use whatever method you want. It's not going to matter uh -huh. because you're not concerned with moving the focus points. The camera will physically move the focus points to the subject. So it's a whole different ballgame. I have a question for you. Um, I currently have a, a Mark D, a, 4, a 5D Mark IV, and I'm considering the R5 with the lens that you just spoke about a few minutes ago. Um, so besides the eye tracking, are there any other strong reasons to go to the R5 and the lens that you mentioned? As yeah, a yeah, so you have more dynamic range in the camera. You have a much better and more accurate focusing system and faster focusing system. You have 45 megapixels versus 32 megapixels. You have um, what you see is what you get in the viewfinder. I mean, there's, and, and it's all going that way. The train left the station. It's not coming back. So you can choose where you want to get on the mirrorless train, but rest assured it ain't coming back. It's good news for the diehards or the people who want to stay DSLR because you're going to be able to get a hell of a lot of lenses 
for for a lot less money because everybody's going to start to sell them. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I just sold my one to four and my twenty four to seventy two eight. So I have a seventy to two hundred that's like brand new and a sixteen to thirty five for sale. If anybody's interested. So yeah, um, all right. I have a, I have another question. Now the cool thing, the cool thing is this: you don't have to be in a hurry to go from EF lenses to RF lenses on the mirrorless bodies, because the adapter that you use with the EF lenses to fit the Canon are flawless. You lose no functionality whatsoever. You have a hundred percent of exactly what you had without using the adapter. That's so great. With the RF lenses, you can't go back compatible. With the EF lenses, you could still use your 5D4 and the new camera. So you don't have to be even be in a rush to do that. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Chris, you had a question? Yeah, yeah, I have a question. Um, I'm, I'm a little confused because on the one hand, you pre-plan your shots. You mentioned you wait till the light is the way you want it and you pre-position yourself. On the other hand, with the, using autofocus and so forth, you're tracking your subjects. And I'm, you know, and if, if a guy wants to shoot in dappled light, you, you know, you leave because that's not the shot you're looking for. So I guess what I'm struggling with is how you balance between pre-planning, I don't know what else to call it, and, you know, and, and, and tracking the subject, that, you know, which is moving. So you're going you're gonna to track the subject to your window of opportunity. So I can position myself relative to the background and where I want the subject to be, not where he is at the time I'm going to take the picture. Now I just have to wait for the subject to orient itself correctly for the light, and then I depress the shutter. So right here where that window's right, that's where I'm going to fire the burst, but I'm going to track the bird from here. So I'm going to lock on the bird from, you know, 50 yards to the right, and when he hits my window, brrrat, and then I'm, then I'm off the hammer. That's it, hmm. right? Thanks. If I want to shoot backlit stuff, then I'm going to concentrate on shooting backlit stuff. You know, so I'll adjust the exposure for that. Now, it's not to say that, you know, if Bigfoot pops out of the woods, I'm not going to try and take the most advantage for him. So, yeah, I might flip the thing to, to Hail Mary mode and put it in P for professional, you know, and just try and get something, right? But for most times, the more I can be proactive rather than reactive, the more successful my imagery is going to be, you know? So, like the Falklands, I mean, it's kind of ludicrous to tell most people, right? But I've had the luxury of being there 14 times. Wow. So, each time I can go with a different lens or I can concentrate, look through my portfolio and say, I don't have this or that. Mm -hmm. So you look at my pictures and everybody goes, ooh, wow, wow. But if you did 18 trips a year like I'm doing, I bet you get a lot of really good pics too. <laughs> so it's also a numbers game. I mean, that's the honest truth. It's not, you know, I'm, I'm not, you know, I didn't drop out of the sky and I can't rest on the seventh day because she who must be obeyed won't let me. So, you know, it's, it's <laughs> yeah. So, by the way, we need a few more boards placed in the deck, you know, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this time at home is killing me. <laughs> well, I think your images are just so passionate and Thank you. so fabulous. Just wonderful. Thanks. Absolutely. What a great evening. Yeah. Thank it you. Is. Yeah, yeah, really yeah, it. Fabulous. Thank you very much. And the best thing you could do, so, um, well, two things. If you're going to put this online, right? I'd love to see it online. Yeah, so yeah. if you got extra comments and stuff like that and you put them in there, just send me a link and then I'll look through the comments. So if somebody has a question you know, or something like that, I'll get to it, I promise. You know, right. so the other thing so is if you able to see this again, well, I think they said they were going to post it, right? They were going to video it. Mm -hmm. Yes. So are you putting it on your website oh, or Facebook? Least, yes. Who else? At least. Yeah. Yeah. yeah okay, so, yeah. Right. So whatever you put it on, just please send me a link and then I'll tell people to go to it as well. You what know? is your website? My website is shoot the light.com. S H O O T the light.com. And then my Facebook and, and Instagram pages are just my name, Charles Glatzer, G-L-A-T-Z-E-R. So if you could put those links, and I'll just throw this up to you. Um, I, I am the exclusive distributor for the Heat Company gloves. They're the best gloves on the planet for shooting uh, cold weather photography. Oh, good. So I'm the sole exclusive distributor for all of North America for the company. So if you go to theheatcompany.us, you'll see those gloves. So I use them in plus 20 down to minus 40. They're the best gloves on the planet. And now wow. the season's coming. So, so yeah, it's really going to kick in. Mm. Will you be wow. doing any traveling under these conditions? Um, we are. Yeah, I have a trip in October um, to do moose in the Tetons. 
And then I have a, a fall tech series up here where I live. So we do mm -hmm. uh, waterfalls, sunrise, sunset. We do the Elk and Catalucci, um, some night sky stuff. And then we do classrooms. And then I have um, uh, Great Smoky Mountain Summit, which is in uh, Tennessee. So I have that at the end of January. And then uh, the Falcons got canceled for November. December, I'm putting up a trip next week for Eagles in uh, Washington. But there's mm -hmm. only like, I think, two spaces available. So. Yeah. Yeah, is the information stuff. on those gloves on your website? Yeah, if you go to my website, shoottheLight.com, and you just, you'll see it'll say gloves, the heat company, just click on that. But if you go to the heatcompany.us, that's the North America. If you go .com and you order them from uh, overseas, they're going to cost you twice as much. Uh, shipping is going to cost you 50 bucks. So we include shipping free in the U.S., same company, but they all come from me. So if you buy them at B&H or any other store, they're all coming from me. So Nice. Yeah, nice. right. Thank, Thank you. you for the tip. Yeah. <laughs> when you're in sub-zero temperatures, how do you keep your batteries alive? Um, with with uh, one DX series, I've never had an issue. He I mean, puts I can them in the gloves. For, yeah, I can shoot for, <laughs> for hours and hours and hours at a time. No issues at all. The mirrorless cameras, because they're fully electronic, they do tend to zap the voltage a little bit. So you need some more batteries. And to answer the, the gal's question about the cameras and stuff, whoops, lost my video. To answer the gal's question, um, the only thing that, that I haven't really tested is the new mirrorless cameras in extreme cold, right? So I still have a couple of 1DX Mark III's that I'm going to hold on to for sure until I know that, you know, the cameras have proven themselves in, in those crazy environments. So there's no manufacturer that guarantees their camera will, you know? But, you know, you look at the Sony camera and they show you pictures shooting in, uh, in the Winter Olympics. And then I've had people shoot them next to me and they all crap out. So they, they fixed a lot of that. You know, they do seem to be better. But all the mirrorless brands do not do as well because they're fully electronic, you know, and they zap more voltage in the crazy cold. So, yeah. So what I told Canon to do is, you see these? Sell those what separately. What is that? It's the battery... Uh, holder that goes in the in the grip yeah so rather than me have to take two batteries out in the middle of the arctic and put them in here and swap them out this is like a gun magazine mm -hmm. so i could preload this thing with two bullets and then when it's time to change it i just slap it in there so i'm like sell the holders separately i'll take two holders separately loaded with the batteries and if they crap out chick, they're in there the other thing you want to do in the cold is get the grips because you have two batteries as opposed to one mm. and last twice as long are you going to go to Bosque again? Um, I used to do it with Canon. It was awesome. Um, Mike Militia is a guy who does a lot of Bosque stuff for me. Um, but it just depends how many people. So, like, here's something. So I do that tech series, right? And, and you can go on my line and you can look at the tech series. And, you know, we typically get 12 to sometimes 20 people. And I have different instructors helping and all that. But it's the most educational venue I guarantee you that you will ever attend. It's four days of this. You know, by the end of it, you start to twitch and drool and, you know, but, but it'll, be the, it'll be the most informative thing you ever do. And there's always people, oh, we want to do it. So if you get 10 people together that think you want to do that, get 10 people, call me up and we'll put a date and I'll come do it. It'll be four days. So it'll blow your mind. Call me, Jackie. And which site is this? <laughs> no, no, no. It's, it's anywhere. Oh, oh anywhere. It's anywhere. Yeah. So I do All one right. in the West That's Coast, one in Florida. I do one here. Yeah. So it's like, if you say, hey, man, you know, we got places up here, as long as there's a place to practice what we preach, you know, so we get a hotel with a class and I come and you got four days worth of drive yourself nuts. Wow. <laughs> That's good. That's good. Definition of heaven. Yeah. Now that's assuming that we can all physically see each other, you yeah. know, but yeah. Yeah. Four days of me talking yeah. myself on the screen, I'll, I'll shoot myself. <laughs> wow. Yeah. It's just... You know, try and take what, what a lot of people tell you is a grain of salt. You know, I've been there. I, this is all I've done for 38 years. You know, I did the weddings and the portraits, and I did all commercial stuff and annual reports and advertising photography and sports. And in the 90s, all I did was underwater photography around the world. Hmm. So I have like a real big pool of resources to draw on. You know, I made hundreds of thousands of color prints, you know, so all that stuff with post-production and all that. So it's like, you know, I try and field whatever questions you guys can throw at me, but it's all practical experience. You know, it's all from doing it. And I, then this is what works. 
you know, in most situations. So again, if you give the camera all the automatics, you have to second guess what it's doing. So if you start with manual and you understand how it all works, then you can take that and kick it into, into auto mode and understand when all that works and when evaluative metering works or spot metering, you know, pick the best tool for the job, you know, pull the best crayon out of the box, right? You know, you could paint a sunset with blue, but not gonna look too good, you know? <laughs> so, oh, so yeah, just, just breathe. When you know? you're on a tripod, do you use a gimbal or a ball head? Depends what I'm shooting. So I use a gimbal head, um, but I found that um, for traveling now with all the weight limitations and all that stuff, I've gravitated to a unique ball. So if you go to uniqueball.com um, or call my office, we sell them, but it's a ball head with a, with a leveling base built in. So it works like a gimbal. So if I travel halfway across the planet, I don't have to take a gimbal and a ball head. I take this one device. So I can put my 600 on there and I guarantee you beyond a shadow of a doubt, I can shoot sharper images with that ball head than I can with a gimbal head, which still has a little bit of bounce to it. So if you just look up the unique ball and then there's another one, um, what the heck's it called? Flex, flex ball or something like that. They both have built in leveling bases, right? So when you level the base, which you should be using if you have a gimbal head, there's an added expense and more weight, right? So otherwise you go outside and you use your gimbal head and you got to keep this sucker loose because to try and compensate when you're panning, if the tripod's not hundred percent level. So with the leveling base, you zero the leveling base. Now, if you move the gimbal head left to right, everything's perfectly level. But with this ball head, it's the same thing. There's two balls. Does it, do I have it up here? Yeah. Hang on one second. This guy is phenomenal. I don't have it. Shoot. Oh my Stand God. Sorry. But anyway, it's a, it's a leveling base that it's got two balls. So you level the outer ball. And once you do that, you can pan left, right, up, down, and nothing is, is out of level. It won't go this way. So if you do portraits, like weddings and stuff, it's phenomenal. Because you don't have to do this nonsense. It's just everything's perfectly level wherever you go. You want to do panos, perfectly level. If you wow. do want to tilt it, you know, and you got the bigger lens, then you could just loosen up the screw on the, you know, on the tripod collar, right, and go like this. Or if you use the outer ball, it becomes just like a normal ball head. So you have the best of both worlds. But it's extremely light. It's small. It's compact, you know, and you only take one. I don't have to take a leveling base and a ball head and hump the stuff across the planet. You know, they're all get, getting tighter and tighter with weight restrictions and size restrictions. Yeah. So we have to modify our gear. You know, it's, um, it's, it's, it's this big quandary. You know, so it's like here's the, a one to 500. Right, but it's four five to seven one. So people are like, why did they make it f four? Well, they do. They have a two to four hundred. So instead of twenty six ninety nine, it's eleven thousand dollars. Oh my a, goodness! And you need a crane to lift it. Mm -hmm. So for a lot of people, right? For a lot of people, you know, the newer cameras have lower noise at higher ISOs. This thing is tack freaking sharp, right? And they're like, yeah, but it's seven one. Well, the one to four at four hundred millimeters is five six. This at, at 400 millimeters is 6.3. A third of a stop different, that's all. So it's all a compromise. Do you want it to go to 600 and be a wider opening? Okay, now you gotta hump around three more pounds. So, you know, yeah, I'd like wow. a 50 to 600 that weighs two pounds, you know, that's F4, yeah. but physically it's not gonna happen. You know, can't, physics, you know, but everything's a compromise, you know. Everything you do full frame or do you do micro four thirds? Nah, I don't do the micro four thirds. Um, I just, I'm not a big fan of the noise, you know? So they, they work great. I mean, that Olympus camera is mind blowing. But to be honest with you, I think if you go above 800 ISO, you know, it just depends what you're going to do, right? So people are always asking, what camera should I buy? I don't know, what do you want to do with it? You know, if your goal is to make eight by tens or 11 by 14s and just put social media stuff, yeah, that four thirds will rock. You can get a Fuji or Olympus or Lumix. They work great. You know, but if your goal is to play with the big boys, you know, when we're selling big prints now for big dollars, I got to do, you know, get the other stuff. So, you know, 45 megapixels, like on the R5, I can crop that down and still have enough room to make a really nice photograph if I need to. My goal is to use all the pixels at my disposal. You know, it's not to put the crop mode on the camera. You know, that's a whole nother thing, right? So you flip the button, you got a 1.6 crop in the viewfinder. All it is is cropping the picture. So if my composition is off, the picture goes in the trash. If I shoot it full frame and crop it in post, I have a little more flexibility. 
Same damn thing. It's, it's no different. You're just taking a smaller piece of the viewfinder or you're cropping in post-production. Now the crop cameras, that's a different story, right? So if you use a 72, like you're talking about with the four thirds, which is double the focal length. So that's the other advantage. You can have a 300 eight, right? And put a 2X in it and, and it's like phenomenal. You know, that 300 eight on that four thirds is a 600 eight, which is this big, super light. So for traveling and everything, yeah, it's killer. That's the big advantage. The fallacy for mirrorless was, hey, we're going to get lighter equipment. Does that look smaller and lighter to you? <laughs> no, it doesn't. <laughs> it really doesn't. You know, maybe it's a little lighter, but the lenses seem to be pretty close to the same size. You know, now everybody wants super fast glass. Oh, yeah, give me a 14 to 24 that's, uh, you know, F14. Okay, here it is. Oof. <laughs> you know. <laughs> So, you know, you're going to have to sit on the couch and curl with it every night in order to hold the damn thing, you know? So, yeah, we'll give it to you, but, you know, it's true. We have, we have a, what is it, a 28 to 70 F2. The thing's like the size of a Maxwell coffee can. It's phenomenal lens, you know, and if you do weddings and portraits, it's unbelievable. But it's a heavy sucker, you know? Wow. So, so yeah, it's all compromises. You know, the whole thing. I mean, they should call all this photography, I think, the art of compromise. Mm. That's what it is. You know, I want this, I want that. I want, you know, I could write a whole book if only, you know. Mm -hmm. If only the light was right. If only the bird looked to the left. If only it was sunny. If only it was, you know. So we, you know, we try to If only I could get down on my stomach and shoot yeah. Yeah. and get right. back up. Right. So we do the <laughs> loons. We do the loons and we eat at four o'clock and then we go out and lay on our belly on a pontoon boat. Oh. <laughs> Most people in the afternoon session are sitting on their bums. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's a tough thing to do. Eat dinner and lay on your belly. It's hard oh, enough on it. Yeah. But it's fun. You know, it's it's really fun, and I it's driving me crazy that I can't get out there and do it. You know. Wow. Where do you go for the loons? Uh, Michigan. Michigan. Yeah, wow. I probably have the best loon portfolio, and I mean, I've been photographing two or three pairs of loons for twenty years. I mean, it's, oh, it's phenomenal. Crazy. If you go on my website and you click on the Loon Workshop, the pictures will blow your mind. What got you to Jones Beach of all places? I used to live in uh, Long Island, Huntington. Okay. <clears throat> we moved to North Carolina um, right after 9-11. Uh, uh -huh. Wow. What did you use to shoot the Loon underwater? Um, I, I actually used a, uh, <laughs> I used a mirrorless camera with a 24 to 105 and a polarizer and shot it from the surface. It just looks like I shot it from underwater. Uh, okay. But, but we do get people who bring um, GoPros on poles, you know, and do video and get them there. It's the lake that we have is really unique. There's some really shallow areas. So you can get the adults and the chicks swimming in like two feet of crystal clear water. Wow. So it's, it's mind blowing. We stand up on the deck with the polarizer and photograph them where we put the, the cameras underwater. So next year, when I go back in June, I'm having a pole cam, you know, that can physically put a big camera underwater you know, with a viewfinder on the top so I can photograph them. I don't think the loons will tolerate, you know, us going physically underwater with them. Yeah. And I don't want to start hand feeding them and train them and all that stuff. So, You know, at the um, alligator farm, I think like five, six, seven years ago, it's been driving me crazy all night where I know you from. You were very helpful to me then. I wasn't even in one of your classes, but... Um, you were there, and I, I had a question, and you were very generous with your time and very smart. So it Thank might you. hit me where I knew you from. Thank you. See, it comes back. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I let people try my lenses all the time, or if I see them, like, they got a short lens, and I got a 600. I'm like, come here, you want to shoot this? They're like, what? So one lady, I couldn't get the lens back on time. <laughs> like, okay, look, it's been a half hour. Come on now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm going to charge your rent. <laughs> but yeah, she was ecstatic about the lens. But yeah, it's all good, you know. Excellent. So yeah. Thank you so, so much. Yeah, you guys are welcome. Yes, oh, thank you. Time. Yeah, good. Good, so post that stuff. Um, if you if you share my, my links and my URLs and all that, it's greatly appreciated. Um, if, if the power that be um, sends a letter to Canon and said they had a good time and all that, uh, it's job security for me, so that oh, means a lot. Okay. Oh, no, you're you're going to uh, get 80, 81 recommendations. Yeah, and Do then if you, are, if you are so inclined, 
I can put a post on my Facebook page for those of you who are on Facebook and say I had a great time on the on the Westchester Photographic Society and you guys could chime in there and say, look, that guy's a bum or, you know, whatever you want to say. Yeah. On there. Yeah. Uh-huh. I'm not on Facebook, but there are many of us who are. Yeah. Be glad to. Yeah. My wife won't do it. She's like, nope, I don't want any part of that. Can you do it on, Inst- can you do it on Instagram? Um, I guess, what would I put on Instagram a, a, for, for like a post? A picture of, uh, Instagram. I could take a picture of all you guys with my iPhone and put that on there. <laughs> Any of you in the a screenshot? Room? A screenshot of all the little images. Dave, are you all, are you all in the the uh, witness protection program? <laughs> <laughs> there you go. So I'll put that picture on Instagram and say, "Hey, thanks to the gang from the Westchester Photo Society," and you could post on there. Oh, okay. perfect. At our perfect. peak, we had Thank ninety you. people Thank here, so. You have to let them know that this was. You got to let them know. I have nobody to contact them. <laughs> yeah. right. Who do we contact? I've forgotten any. Our Canon contact. Why um, don't you Why don't you give Serge your con your Canon contact, and we'll take it from there. Now the Canon, it's the Canon's different. So so Canon. Spot- no, no, it's it's to my page. It's Charles Glatzer. So it's either Charles Glatzer on Instagram or Charles Glatzer on Facebook. Okay. okay. Cool. Yeah. That's it. Get out. <laughs> I got it. <laughs> I need something. Bye, everyone. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank 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 you.